Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fourth Sociology and Anthropology Undergraduate Student Research Conference with the theme, Experiences, Entanglements, and Understandings of the Social. This conference entails morning and afternoon sessions. We will listen to the compelling research of our undergraduate students under their respective programs. I am Art, and I am the facilitator for the morning session. And to officially open our event, let, it, let me call on Dr. Jose Joel Canuday, Chairperson of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Ateneo de Manila University. Right. Uh, Dr. Bubbles Azor, um, fellow members of the uh, faculty, the department, uh, students, uh, good morning to, to everyone and welcome to this conference. Um, I was looking at the the poster and I, well, I didn't really look at it in the way that I've looked at it before. And I noticed that um, it was noted here that this is the fourth uh, sociology and anthropology undergraduate student conference. But but actually, this event, what, what we're doing, dates back uh, way further, further back in time. Uh, probably this is really the, uh, the, the marker. That, that, that we did when we set up the AB sociology program. But the department has a, 
So it's a very interesting history because this is not the first sociology program of the Ateneo de Manila, of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. In fact, the program started way back, probably even before I was born, uh, 1960s, 1970s, there were already AB sociology uh, back then. And uh, we do have um, quite an illustrious uh, uh, graduates. Um, some of them had led the corporate world. And, and for those who had uh, moved into MA, uh, some of them have also become martyrs. And uh, one of those who had become one uh, was a Jesuit priest named um, Father Rudaswamy. Uh, he, he had been advocating for indigenous rights in India and had been jailed several times uh, for the works that he had been uh, doing. Um, and, and for the curiosity and, and the, the, the interest that he had been uh, taking on in understanding people, uh, making sense of people, and um, also working uh, around and along with people. He was, he was jailed for, for quite some time. And um, I'm not so sure if he died in jail, but, but in the long time that, that he was um, repeatedly arrested, even at the ripe age of 70, 80 years old, uh, he, he passed on. Um, I'm, I'm saying this, I'm, I'm articulating this because uh, this is exactly and essentially the social world that we are engaging in, that we're dealing with. As I noted, the, the, the colorful history of the sociology and anthropology program of the department is, is, is quite uh, diverse and, and interesting because it cuts across the corporate engagement, business, uh, eco 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 economy, some of them becoming part of the captains of, of, of the industry, and others had, had, had become martyrs uh, themselves. So what we are about to embark on, what we are about to, to, to undertake is an engagement that, that we would do under the ages, under the shadows uh, of, uh, of those who came before us and those who came before us had shown their mettle in understanding the experiences and also the, the complexity or the entanglements uh, that, that society offers. And, and I think um, the research that had been done uh, this, this, this year uh, by you, by, by, by the students, um, reflect uh, uh, parts of that. And I do believe that as you move on, walk into the professional field. And, and, and since this is really the, one of the culminating highlights uh, of your stay at the AB Sociology Program of the Ateneo, um, you would be taking uh, this, not only what you've learned in, in this research and in the program, but as well as the hope, at least for the department, is uh, for you to take on that, that ages, that, that shadows, that loom large for us, whatever paths you would take. You would take on the paths of martyrdom, just like Father uh, Lurdaswamy, or you would take on the path of being corporate uh, leaders or even political leaders in the industry. And I would no longer highlight how many political leaders we have uh, produced, senators, congressmen, and, and, and so on, and um, um, CEOs. So there's a path ahead uh, for everyone. But what I wish that, that, that everyone would have to, to, to take with them is the, the learning that at the end of it all, we are uh, trying to understand the social world, not for the sake of understanding, but for the sake of taking action and doing something about it. Thank you very much and welcome to this conference. Thank you so much, Dr. Joel. And to, ins to inspire our students, young scholars and attendees alike, it is an honor to introduce our keynote speaker. She is an assistant professor at the Department of Sociology, University of the Philippines, Diliman. She received her PhD in sociology from the National University of Singapore. Her research interests include migrant organizations, religions, migration relations, labor migration, and international migration in South Korea. She is currently the editor-in-chief of the Philippine Sociological Review and special issue editor for Hanfield Studies on Korea and the Philippines. Let us welcome Dr. Bubbles Beverly and Azor.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kanudai, professors, um, students. Good morning. Uh, first of all, it is, I would like to express that it is such a great pleasure and honor for me to give this keynote address in the fourth sociology and anthropology undergraduate student research conference here at the Ateneo de Manila University. I am not quite sure if I'm even worthy uh, to deliver a keynote address. As I've always been, as, as I as I have always associated the term keynote address, um, you know, uh, to people with certain statures in organizations and professions, such as you know the International Sociological Association, for example. Um, so, in the International Sociological Association, I hope that you can be a member of because that's part of our epistemic community. Um, I remember listening to Saskia Sassen, I hope you know her, and Dr. Emma Porius keynote addresses in Yokohama, Japan in 2014, and another address by Professor Margaret Abraham in Toronto, Canada in 2018. So having these, you know, keynote addresses in my head, I sort of panicked immediately after accepting Nino, Dr. Levista's invitation to give this keynote address. All sort of thoughts, you know, dawned on me of what I would be discussing and am I really worth it to discuss it in the first place to give this address. But then again, because I impulsively um, said yes to the invitation of Dr. Levisa because he's a good friend of mine, as if he, you know, he just invited me for a cup of coffee along Katipunan Avenue to discuss, you know, the woes and joys of being academic. So here I am, um, but I will try my best to do the job of what I would often call in my theory classes at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, of laying the land um, and to explore the theme of today's conference, which is experiences, entanglements, and understanding of the social. I don't have PowerPoint slides because I realized after two and a half years of doing online that students stop taking notes. So I will not be using any PowerPoint slides and I hope you will take down notes because taking down notes is a very good skill, not just for researchers, but for our brain. Our brain is wired to take down notes, especially physical um, activity while we are using our brain. So I think starting <laughs> with a disclaimer that I'm not you know, certain if I'm worthy to deliver a keynote address may not be quite a good start, right? early in the morning. So let me briefly tell you about myself and my journey as an accidental sociologist, borrowing David Martin's app description of Peter Berger, I hope you know him, whose work on interpretive sociology inspired me a lot as a sociologist and will serve as a framework of what I will be sharing with you today. By briefly tracing my journey as an accidental sociologist, I will link my own biography to the more general discussion of how we experience and understand the social and encounter the entanglements within the social using the sociological perspective. So please indulge me here just a little bit. Um, I promise that this recollection would be hopefully short and sweet for my standard, but please tell me if my time is up, you just cut me off, I'll be fine with that. So as Charles Limert, um, in his book, I hope you have read this, Social Things, an Introduction to the Sociological Life, skillfully posited that we should not allow yourself to be fooled into thinking that personal stories are merely personal and find somehow to the small interaction of the local people. If the story of a man from, let's say, you know, Yemen or Burundi uh, contains trace effects of the larger social, social worlds, no less is true of my story or yours. So I call myself an accidental sociologist because I found sociology through a series of accidents and botches, if you can call it like that. Botches because, you know, you expect something, it didn't work out that way. So I have those. A very long journey, I would call it. Um, my undergraduate degree is political science. I enjoyed studying political philosophy, but I found myself too isolated in this subfield, in this specialization. I didn't have any professor or a colleague to discuss political philosophy with. So as part of my quest for my, you know, epistemic identity and my personhood at the same time, because when you 
look for knowledge or you construct knowledge or you, you produce knowledge. It's for your epistemic um, identity. But at the same time, it greatly impacts or affect your personhood as well. So that was uh, I was aiming for, and I hope you are doing that as well. Um, so I was looking for a kind of specialization. I was looking for something which I could employ to understand the social world beyond the notion of myself, beyond the notion of, you know, the sense of self, beyond me, I, and me. Um, so one day I heard a college professor say that he was doing a master's in Philippine studies. So at the time I didn't know what to do with my life, but I wanted to do something social, but I didn't know what. And I'm sure you are at that liminal stage of your lives as well. I thought that it sounded so cool to be studying, you know, a certain particular society like the Philippines. Um, so I immediately enrolled uh, for a master's degree program after immediately after college graduation. To my naivete, I found out that Philippine studies, of course, was taught in Filipino, totally. But and then I was told that I should write my thesis in academic Filipino. So I left the College of Arts and Letters and I was roaming around the University of the Philippines. It was such a liminal state, search, searching for something, a particular heuristic device to understand what was going on in front of me. Um, so I shifted still Philippine studies, but from College of Arts and Letters to the Asian Center. So this time, I hope that the medium of instruction and the medium of writing the thesis would be in English, and it was. I finished the coursework so fast because I love studying, um, maybe because I didn't have a job, so I, at least I had something to do. Um, my thesis supervisor, so, so I finished the coursework really fast. I, I promise this would be short and sweet, but it, it doesn't <laughs> sound that way. Um, so I had no thesis topic good for you, you have, I didn't have at the time. My thesis supervisor suggested, you know, regional security in Southeast Asia. So well, I, I, I took it. I voraciously read up about it. I went to the library, read from 8 a.m. to 12 midnight. I love the library. I hope you do too. Um, because if you don't have a social life, then you feel good that you're in the library alone, right? Um, he then suggested, so I returned to him and I said, I, there's no intellectual puzzle for me about regional security in Southeast Asia. He then suggested international migration in Southeast Asia. At the time, I didn't know that, you know, people do systematically study international migration. So I ran to the library, my favorite place, and I found an aha moment. Just like you, I'm sure that when you were writing your thesis, you found those aha moments, those eureka moments. Um, and I, I found joy. And I found excitement. I was in trance, you know, reading about Filipino workers outside the Philippines. So many of the reading materials were written by sociologists. And I knew at the time sociology was something for me, but I didn't know exactly why, because I didn't know what sociology was. But I thought it's something to study, especially if you're interested in international migration. To study the international migration, I thought that I should be going out overseas for field work because it's international um, migration, definitely. So I chose Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia because of the proximity uh, to the Philippines. I spent two months, I think one month because of the visa, um, and I stayed in the Philippine Embassy Resource Center by accident. So before going there, I interviewed someone, a labor attache. I think it's Jimenez, President Jimenez. I'm not so sure, but I used to call him as Labat Jimenez. The, the new president of the University of the Philippines. And then he gave me a paper and he said, okay, you go to Malaysia and perhaps you can show it to the Philippine embassy and uh, you know, what happens? You just see what happens. And I was given a free stay at the Philippine Embassy Resource Center, which was good. If you're a field worker, you're a field researcher, that would be good for you. That would save you a lot of money. And that means you will be within the field site and immersing yourself there day in, day out. So that's what I did. Um, I was both overwhelmed and blown away by what I found um, out. Is that my call? Oh, no. oh, okay, <laughs> because I still have a few pages. Uh, migration experience of overseas, is that to pray or something? Should we pray or something? 
Okay. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I forgot. <laughs> I'm, I've been. Should I shut up first? No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Lord. Uh, migration experiences of overseas Filipino workers, I found out, were very complex. And there are multiple and varied textures, threads, and colors that you know, are woven intricately so that there would be a holistic one picture, just like a quilt. If you see a quilt, they're beautifully done, but the way to do it was done for every texture, every color, and every, um, um, every yeah, every texture. So I deeply immersed in the lives of the Filipino migrants at the resource center and hang out. I hope you did this too for your uh, thesis. I hang out. The Filipinos on their Sunday day offs in front of the St. John's Cathedral and at a McDonald's in front of the church. Um, and this is where the better part <laughs> I've been going on and on. Um, I listen to people's subjective migration realities, you know, such as experiences with good employers, experiences of abuse with bad employers, establishing social ties with fellow migrants who eventually became their, you know, fictive kins and social, um, social networks. And these subjective migrant realities were interspersed with objective realities they face on a daily basis. These objective realities included migration regimes, systemic discrimination, everyday racism, precarity caused by uncertainty in labor markets, gender inequality, how to maintain transnational families, um, womanhood, masculinity, um, femininity, and demographic changes. Those are what we call as objective realities. Using the case of Filipino migrants in Kuala Lumpur and subsequently my PhD research on the role of the Catholic Church in the integration of Filipino migrants in South Korea, these two realities of migration, the subjective and the objective, are and should not be dichotomized and not be treated in binary. That is a very unproductive endeavor of this clearly demarcating between what we call in sociology as methodological sub subjectivism versus methodological objectivism. This is also called methodological individualism, if you remember Weber, and methodological holism or collectivism, if you recall um, Durkheim. This has dominated the social sciences and sociology for such a long time. But in between the subjective reality, which is basically, I will just repeat it, a cognitive state of the individual, which is the object of study and inquiry for psychology, um, and the objective reality, which Durkheim would call the social facts, these are empirical facts in the objective world. In between these two are what we call as intersubjective reality, or the co-construction of everyday reality. What do we mean by, by intersubjectivity? These are shared understanding through social interaction, which I did with the migrants in Kuala Lumpur and Seoul in South Korea. Um, this is done through social interaction, through language, and through socialization. And by now, you're very so sick and tired of these concepts. In the case of migrants, migration is an intersubjective experience in its various phases from pre-departure, arrival, settlement, adjustment, and settlement. And for those, for some, especially labor migrants, return to home countries such as the Philippines. These are shared by migrants as they encounter and come into dialogue with a host society, migrant organizations, local people, what we call the strange norms, beliefs, values, and practices. This intersubjectivity from the more constructivist and interpret interpretivist perspective is what can be called as social. So what I'm doing right now is to define what is social so that I can lay the land of what the theme of the, the conference is all about. Let me now discuss the concept of the social. In layman's vocabulary, the term social pertains to interaction between individuals and group. And according to David E. Brown in his 2014 book, The Concept of the Social in Uniting the Humanities and Social Sciences, little can be found in literature that comes close to discussing its meaning beyond what is offered in Oxford English Dictionaries, references to social as the ability to be associated or united to others. You might think you know this already. 
and what that is the subject matter of sociology, right? Many things that are taken for granted, very commonsensical things, and even the social. Why, why, why in the world do we need to define it? But we need to. And I'm sure in your research, you need to define something before you can even think of a research question, before you can think about your research design. So um, despite the omnipresence and the commonsensical and the everyday mundane ordinary usage of the word social, there seems to be no consensus of what it is exactly semantically, ontologically, teleologically speaking. Even from the early days of sociology as a discipline, the social was in question, according to Patrick Joyce, although the conceptualization of the social was eventually solidified within and beyond our discipline sociology. Weber put emphasis on history, you know this very well, uh, when he talked about the social, while George Simmel, my favorite sociologist, pointed to cessation as a relation or process and not society as a unified totalized entity. That is Durkheim for, for us, that the object of analysis for us is the society. But according to George Simmel, it's not that, it is cessation or interaction in a very relational and processual manner. So in contemporary sociology, we can identify related concepts to the social, such as sociality, network, movement, and reflexivity, almost synonymous to the social. That's why you don't often hear the word social anymore, because they have been, it has been uh, replaced, interchanged with other concepts. Using Wittgenstein's family resemblance, I hope you know what, how, how to do um, Wittgenstein's family resemblance, we can, also over, uh, we can also glean overlapping similarities of the concept social with other concepts such as community, society, reciprocity, mutuality, exchange, social order, civil society, cooperation, and even culture, often interchanged. But why is it crucial for us, I know you're super bored now, to go through this arduous task of semantic, ontological, epistemological, and teleological definition, not only of the concept social, but also of any concept that we employ in our research. I have um, uh, gone through this um, program. There are concepts here such as you know, positioning, myth-making. So before you can even go to your field, you have to define what it is. Define it semantically, ontologically, teleologically. And why do we have to do that? Defining something is the act of, you know, marking out, delimiting the outlines or the characteristics of any conception or anything, even your life. Well, what are you going to have today? Oh, I'm going to have, I don't know, rice. So in your head, you know how to define rice. Why do we need to do that vis-a-vis -vis the social world? We need to do that because we're going to go insane. We're going to go to asylum if we don't have boundary specification. I call this as boundary specification. Um, according to F. Stewart Chapin's article of definition or the definition of concepts, which, by the way, was written in 1932, but still very useful to us, defining something or what exactly the phenomenon we are investigating is part of conceptualization, which is in many ways a process of, as I already mentioned, boundary specification. Concepts such as the social and other related concepts may go through stages of development. First, being implicit as a thought. Oh, I'm going to work on myth making. Um, second, it becomes explicit in the wide use of a term. How do laymen, you know, how do lay people use it? Um, my favorite joke about PhD in NUS is one of the professors was discussing something and one classmate suddenly talked about anecdotes and anecdotes and stories. And the, the professor said, you sound like a taxi driver. So my friend, my classmate was completely, completely insulted. And I thought at the time, very rude professor. But then again, now that I am teaching, there is nothing wrong with what the professor mentioned, that you sound like a taxi driver. A taxi driver meaning representing the lay language the ordinary, the mundane language. But we are sociologists and we have a very distinct language that we use. You can call it jargon. Does that mean we are exclusivist, elitist, or snobbish people? No, 
It's just that that's our job, that we can offer more than what lay people could offer. Hence, we need to define, we need to conceptualize. And the third is, according to Chapin, is attaining precise definition of this term, either verbally labeling it as such in words or heuristically in terms of diagrams or graphs. Now, I think you, it makes sense to you why your supervisors, DC supervisors or professor ask you, where is your diagram? Diagram is a form of defining something, heuristically speaking, or operationally, which, is which should be found in your um, research design. What do we mean by operational definition? This is in terms of measurements and indicators, right? This is what we call as boundary specification. Without these, the social actors, the individuals who are members of the social world will just go insane, according to George Simmel. Hence, we have what we call as blasé attitude. Blasé attitude meaning here is you are disinterested, detached, putting distance from what you are studying and investigating so that you will not be overwhelmed by millions and thousands of things going on in front of you. That's why the, our brain is wired to categorize. Our brain is wired to define something. Our brain is wired to have boundary specification. So following this, I would like to suggest three conceptualizations of the social. Three conceptualizations, maybe two, <laughs> which we may find, I'm not so sure, arguable, debatable, but for me at least plausible and possible in capturing how social actors understand and experience the social and all the entanglements within the social. The first one, which I already briefly touched on earlier is intersubjectivity. The concept of intersubjectivity has the potential of connecting, meaning inter. Um, what it connects are seemingly autonomous subjects or selves. It hence promises to bridge the gap between the macro and the micro, the objective and the subjective realities. I hope by now you are quite aware what we do in sociology. These are the core sociological debates macro and micro relationship, subjective and objective relationship. And I will um, um, uh, present to you later what are the other sociological debates that you must be engaging with as a sociologist, okay? Um, so Birch and Lachman, I'm sure you know, you know these two people, adapted the concept of Schutz and Husserl uh, this notion of intersubjectivity as the, I quote, enigma of how men can understand the fellow men. Please do not judge them. They are product of their society. They, they, don't, they, didn't, they didn't have gender sensitivity at the time, so I'm quoting them uh, verbatim. Um, and introduced it to the sociological mainstream. It was via Berger and Lachman, not via phenomenology, via Husserl philosophy and um, Alfred Schutz. In short, the big question, which we still ask until today, is why people's expectation to understand and to be understood by others is a socially viable strategy. Why do we need to understand others? And why do you need to be understood by others? This is part of not going insane. This is part of not going to the asylum. Because if you don't understand what's going on in the social world, such as what is the meaning of the symbol of the traffic light, you're going to go crazy. Right. So I think we are in a very privileged position as sociologists to know this systematically, scientifically, with a lot of rigor. Other people have competence, sociological competence, according to Lemart. But then again, they don't do it as a vocation. They don't do it as their job. They don't do it as a student like you who study it systematically. So in short, our life would have been better. Better not because we are better intellectually, better in terms of, you know, um, that we can maneuver and survive and thrive the social world, but we are in a very privileged position to understand how, why people act the way they do and why people behave the way they do. Not just people, but also groups, events, and even macro forces. Um, 
Wendelin Reich, in his article, Three Problems of Intersubjectivity and One Solution, which was published in 2010 in Sociological Theory. I hope you will have time to read it. Um, sociological theory is a good thing to, to read on a daily basis rather than watch, watching Netflix. Um, provided a working definition of intersubjectivity as a situation in which two or more person share knowledge reflexively. That is all we know about X, and we know that others know this too. For example, what is marriage, right? That's an objective reality. Marriage as defined by, you know, Catholic Church, by the state, according to the legal system, that is the objective reality. But then there is also this subjective reality of what individual pe person, what individuals would define marriage for them based on what Schutz calls their biographical situation. But in between this, bio, this objective reality and subjective reality about marriage, two people would come together and they have multiple realities about marriage because they come from unique biographical situation. They will come together and they will produce a new reality, an intersubjective reality, which we now call as marriage. It comes from two subjective realities of love, maybe companionship, maybe of, I don't know, some instrumental reason, sex probably, and coming together, and then they call it now as marriage. It's a new reality. So imagine that we have millions and thousands and hundreds of subject, subjective reality vis-a-vis -vis thousands and hundreds of intersubjective reality plus thousands and hundreds of objective reality. Our brain as social beings are amazing. Okay, I'm in a trance, so you don't feel excited about it. So just like the individual experience, narrative, aspiration, or personal stigma, which I found in the program, uh, which you uh, are working on, or you have finished working on, all, uh, all our respondents, all the people that we talk to on a daily basis, they have what we call, as I already mentioned, biographical situation. According to Abdul Masadov, his doctoral dissertation on the intersubjective understanding of violence among Tajik immigrant workers in post-Soviet Russia. How do this, you know, very personal biography, very unique stories that you have, that your respondents have, how do they become social in the first place, right? In fact, we will have millions and millions of subjective stories out there, anecdotes, vignette, you can call it anything. Right. So whenever you do research, you will be, you know, listening to stories and then you think, oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. That's so amazing. But what is social about those personal vignettes? OK, it is social because we come into contact with the social world and experience the moment of this interaction. When you interview or you talk to someone, your interlocutor telling you their subjective experience and then there you are as an observer observing the observee that is a moment of interaction but you don't think about it because it's so basic that social interaction that is be being a researcher we don't really think about it so much because they are so commonsensical however these experiences accumulate in our consciousness and thanks to our own experience of you know our various spheres of observation within the society, suddenly these moments of interaction will have specific meanings and concrete structure for people living and acting. And suddenly that reality structures and organizes our lives. Such as I, I, I go back to the, my previous example of marriage. Suddenly it's organizing us, our lives, our social relationship, where we go, right? So um, this is how we first experience the social or intersubjectivity by making contact with the social world. When I, when I say the social world, it could be people, groups, things, and events. Through accumulation of these experiences in our consciousness and our through social interactions, we co-construct the meanings attached to the things within the social world. Suddenly we label them as something, flirtation, um, dating, through those interactions and co-productions and multiple realities that you put in via that particular moment. 
right? It is designed in such a way that the attention of the majority of those present is directed to the front. For example, this lecture hall, let's just use it as, a, as an example. This lecture hall may not mean so much to you. you. You took it so much for granted. However, as you can see, there is this table and all your attention is there. If I'm not the, the, the keynote speaker, that would be your professor. This means hierarchy, but we never thought about it. This is a hierarchy manifesting itself in the seating arrangement, the tables, the projector, the screen, etc. A lecture hall obviously resembles a kind of theatrical space, which makes it the front region, according to Irving Goffman. The design of these lecture hall manifest, among other things, humanistic educational ideals that Dr. Kanudai talked about. But at the same time, it's also a something politics about this, the value of perhaps Ateneo is teaching you certain values in UP, it's honor and excellence, supposedly. A lecture hall elicits a specific behavior and social roles from the lecturers, the students, the janitorial staff, you know, we have roles to play. I'm sure you're very, very bored now, but it's your role to nod a little bit, to pretend that you're interested in what I'm saying. Uh, your professors here grading you and whatnot, that is your role. My role, because I'm a friend of Nino, is to prepare this, this keynote, right? But I'm enjoying it, don't worry. <laughs> so um, what we are doing here basically is, is that there is something about this lecture hall that we are intersubjectively experiencing. It may mean different things, multiple realities, but these various multiple realities from all of us here are coexisting. We are also negotiating it. It's not necessarily unlike the Marxist tradition that we are in dialectical tradition. When you say dialectical, that we are contradicting each other. This one is we are negotiating with each other. And when we say negotiating with each other, I may not agree with you, you may not agree with me in my reality, but we are cre creating a new reality, which we call now as intersubjectivity, and that is the social. Um, if you are familiar with Chicago School of Chicago uh, sociologist William S. Thomas in his Thomas theorem, by the way, there are two Thomases, husband and wife, but usually it's William S. Thomas that have been uh, famously um, alluded to for this um, passage, if men define their definition as real, they are real in their consequences. So the way we define intersubject intersubjectively and experience this lecture hall becomes real based on the consequences that it has on us and impact on us at the moment. It's real for you. You're sitting there, I'm standing here, this is the role that we are playing. But at the same time, why are we all you know, doing this in the name of learning? That's the manifest uh, function. But the latent function is I just want to shit fucking graduate, right? That's the, 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 the uh, other function. And we understand those are realities as well. However, there are entanglements in understanding these intersubjective experiences of the social especially in terms of empirical research, which you did, and I commend you and your supervisors for doing it. Wendelin Reich presented three problems. The first is a philosophical problem, the trap and the possibility of misunderstanding the other's minds, given that the human mind may be reinterpretable because of hierarchies of impulses and needs of human, and that the observee you know, you and you observing me, so I become your observee, is unable to keep, to keep his or her or their, I'm, I'm having a hard time with pronouns, um, but it's politically correct, <laughs> his or her or their mental operation consistent, right? So how would we know that how we read each other's mind is correct? That's basically a philosophical problem that, you know, we can trace back long time ago from Machiavelli to whatnot, right? In short, observers such as you, me, sociologist, has the task to generate transparency in the face of opacity and ambivalences in the multiple realities being presented by the observer. It's really hard to be a sociologist and to, to, capture, to capture the subjective reality as correct 
plus the intersubjective reality as transparent and consistent, plus the fact that there is, again, the objective reality that you, we know very well through our socialization. The second problem is phenomenological. So the first one is um, uh, philosophical. The second one is phenomenological, which pertains to the heavy reliance of intersubjectivity on the subject rather than on the social interaction, rather than on the inter or the connecting between multiple selves. So the problem of phenomenology here is the less discussion on the social interaction, meaning how do we simultaneously give each other our subjective realities? How, how is that process of simultaneity? Do you give and take while we are doing the social interaction, while we are in this theatrical space? How do we do that? How do you know that my subjective reality and your intersubjective reality can be negotiated? This is a phenomenological problem. Unfortunately, this phenomenological problem, this paradox of simultaneity, between the observer and the observee was the one popularized in sociology by Berger and Luckman. This paradox of how do we really deal with each other, negotiate with each other in terms of sharing and the flow of, of, of subjective reality. According to this entanglement posited by Parsons and Lu, um, sorry, so the third problem is, so the, 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 there's the philosophical, there's phenomenological. The third problem is um, sociological. This third pro problem is based on what we call as double contingency. This is based on Parsons and Lumen. I hope I'm not boring you. We are now getting into the more boring part, of course, Parsons. According to the theory of social system, I hope you know social system theory by Parsons and Lumen. There is this mutual transparency of all participants in any social encounter. And the consequent unpredictability of each other's behavior may lead to an indeterminate situation that gives room to the autonomous emergence of a third force. So basically, we don't understand each other because of, you know, the opacity of our subjective reality. And that would create a, a kind of barrier in the intersubjectivity. So what Parsons and Luhmann are suggesting is there should be a third force we call social system. It is one of the central tenets of Parsons theory of social system that there is this ensuing problem of order. You must know this because of Durkheim, that it cannot be solved locally, individually. That is from within the encounter, that is that intersubjective moment, right? Any party's private decision to be honest, to be trustworthy is insufficient. Because basically what the problem is, how do we know that I can trust you? How do I know that the observer and the observee can trust each other or that they are honest with each other? This is also the problem with Irving Goffman. I'm a Goffmanian. Um, Goffmanian sociology. How do we know that in the interaction order of people during civil inattention, for example, or, you know, brushing elbows with each other, but maintaining a very high level of civility because you are super aware uh, of each other and how you should act um, and behave um, in, in your co-presence with each other? How would you know that you are not just performing it or you are insincere about it? So this is the problem of Parsons about intersubjectivity. Parsons believes that social order has to enter from the outside. Very, sounds familiar, like right? very Dirk Hyman, social fact, in the form of constraints on interaction that are organized in social system. What is, are these social systems? Social institutions such as the polity, uh, the market, the economy, um, education, aesthetics, sports. They have their own logics. They have their own logics that tell us, that impose on us, that constrain us how to behave and there are expectations from our behavior. Um, in his version of systems theory, it is up to the shared basis of normative order in the form of symbolic system or common culture to guarantee that there is indeed a stability of the social interaction. In short, um, social systems theory such as Parsons and Luhmann are, are crit critiquing or criticizing intersubjectivity as being disorderly, disorganized, right? 
Contrary to earlier promises, um, Luhmann, on the other hand, he still thinks that social appears on stage and takes over control, such as the theatrical space, just, just like this um, lecture hall. According to Luhmann's oft-repeated definition, the operation of communication is the fundamental and unit-like institution constituent of social systems. It operates autonomously vis-a-vis -vis the involved mental systems, decomposing via the self through utterance, information, and understanding. In short, there must be a third force so that the stability and the order of the interaction could be maintained. To resolve these problems of intersubjectivity, phenomenological, philosophical, and sociological, Wendelin Reich suggested social understanding could be achieved through the means of interactional infrastructure so that we can, you know, seamlessly make use and understand and experience the social despite the entanglements. For, for Reich, we should hold agents, you and me, and social actors to make ourselves understandable. I think this is now a kind of um, interesting phenomenon these days because of the internet, because of social media and, you know, how we communicate, that we are no longer understandable to each other. This can be resolved through, uh, this can also resolve the observational problem we often encounter when we are doing research. For example, initially, there is always a symmetrical encounter. What is this asymmetrical encounter where intersubjectivity takes place? The ego, meaning the observer, tries to observe the alter, meaning the observee. And is it a position to draw consequences from her observation? Consequences that will affect the observees positively or negatively. For instance, if the observer is a police officer, then there is a stroller, you know, someone walking, that's the observer, sometimes we call it ego and the altar. The observer, the police person, has to decide whether to stop him and check his ID, right? Now, what if the observer, the police person, though notoriously unable to look inside the, the, the observee's head, just decide to observe him arbitrarily? Oh, maybe he's um, a juvenile delinquent. Maybe he is uh, trying to commit some crime just by observing. This is an observational problem. And we experience this in our research without interviewing, without communicative strategies, without you know, doing um, what, uh, what, what is called as communicative understanding, we may fall into the trap of observational problem because we are doing it arbitrarily. For instance, we may establish a rule that you know, the policeman may establish a rule that everybody who is wearing a very particular grim expression has criminal intention and is worth checking. We call this as police profiling. This happens in the United States with, you know, colored people being usually checked and frisked. Also, it happens at the airport. If you are a colored person, you are more likely to be seconded. Seconded meaning your bag is checked for the second time. Well, white people, white travelers often do not get seconded. Right. I experience being seconded many times because of my gender, my or my nationality and my age. Now I'm older, so I don't get seconded. Being seconded, meaning you are being uh, checked or being suspected to be like a drug mule or, a, you know, sex worker going overseas or whatnot. Right. So if the police person or the observer were to use such a rule of, you know, uniformly and standardizing uh, the observational um, skill, it would be vital for the observee to be able to count on her using it. So you are now checking and waiting, like what I usually do with, um, you know, um, my immigration officer. I think I will be seconded here because she's a female. I will not fall in line there. I will go to the male immigration officer a bit younger i mean i'm gonna use my feminine capital and say good morning i'm going to the u.s for a conference right you smile and you whatnot because you're expecting a particular um behavior towards you and it is worth checking but however it's actually very unreasonable and unfair especially if you're a feminist but i i use it for my own advantage 
as soon as the, the observer is able to anticipate, I mean, the observee is able to anticipate the observer's policing rule, it is just rational for him to adjust the behavior accordingly. So this is what is amazing about intersubjectivity. We are not passive. We are not, we are not devoid of our agency or our agentive capacity. We can adjust our behavior accordingly based on what we think um, this, this person, this, this observer, this ego would react towards us based on observation. However, however, it may not be enough. There must be an equal employment of observational understanding and communicative understanding. Observation understanding, meaning it can be achieved if the mental and affective states have very clear manifestation in terms of bodily states and behavior. For example, if you're super angry, it has physical and bodily manifestation in your behavior. So that is easy to detect. However, things like ambivalences, such as maybe doubting, suspecting. Will you, will you be smirking? Will you be grimming? Will you have a grim expression? So you're not sure, right? Having these two resolutions, so while the latter, meaning communicative understanding, uh, will be able to achieve what we call as internal and intentionality consistency, such as what are the hidden motives when you are doing the interview? You can check on it. You can do follow-up questions. You can also check on the manifest motives. So for example, um, let me see, community organizing in the Philippines, the case of uh, Zone 1 Tondo organization. So you may ask the question, why did you mobilize your, your community or your neighborhood to, um, you know, to do this? Then you say, oh, because I believe in it, because, and then your, 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 your respondent would, you know, say all the nicest things. But you, you would know that sometimes our respondents or our interlocutors have hidden motives as well. This can be achieved and this can be resolved when we have communicative understanding. Hence, interviewing is not just, you know, to siphon information and data from our respondents and interlocutors, but it is a social relationship. It is a social relationship that you are not doubting or who you are talking to because that's unethical, but you are pretty sure that there's more to it. That's the job of sociologists, that we go deeper um, uh, beyond the taken for granted or whatever is at face value. Also, the resolution given by Reich, uh, Reich may lead to sequential adjustability where participants have the possibility to recalibrate and calibrate personal information which they have given or given off to others. So by, by you know, having this equal employment between observational understanding and um, communicative understanding, we may achieve what, what we call as um, sequential adjustability. We calibrate personal information. Should I give it or not? Should I share it or not? And another thing that we can uh, achieve is what we call as pragmatic accountability, that we make our observe V accountable for, or we oblige our observee or respondent and the people that we talk to, uh, to make himself intelligible. To, by, by doing so, the person can also select and control his actions in accordance with the anticipation of the observer's anticipation. So you are anticipating what the other is anticipating. That is intersubjectivity, which is part of the social. Right. So what I am trying to say here that is that we have to conceptualize and really think deep whenever we use a concept such as the social. Why do we need to do that? You know, at the more pragmatic level, at the more practical level, it's going to make your social life easier. It would make you better people. It would make you better daughter to your mother, better son to your parents, better students to your professors, because you know how to navigate. Is it insincere because you know the rules and the logic and the feel of the game, as Bourdieu would call it? No, you're not insincere because we cannot be insincere the whole time. Can you imagine being insincere and performing at all times? 
Goffman would call it that, yes, there is the back region. You can take a rest and be yourself. But at the same time, there's always the front region where you have to follow the rules because the rules constrain you and expect you to behave in a certain way. At the more theoretical, methodological, and conceptual level, I think it is important for us sociologists, especially young sociologists like you, to really follow the logic of our discipline. Sometimes we do not know what sociology is, and we start with what is the social so that we can know what is sociological. And for that, um, I thank you so much for your attention, and um, I hope you learn a thing or two or have a takeaway from what I presented. Thank you so much, Dr. Asor. We enjoyed and learned a lot from you on both personal and academic aspects. At this point, we now proceed to the presentation proper. Uh, from morning until afternoon, we will look into 12 uh, researches of our 31 undergraduate students under um, the guidance of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and their respective supervisors. Um, May I now invite our first group of presenters under the cluster, which is theme, perils, peoples, and the peculiarities of change. The research is entitled, Negotiating Disaster, Understanding the Disaster Risk Management Experiences of Marikina Residents, presenters Lorenzo Miguel C. Cabalza and Carlo Miguel B. Velasco. Their supervisor is Dr. Maria Andrea Roda Soco. The examiners are Dr. Justin C. Authority Junife Payot and Dr. John Paolo Dalupang. Okay, so good morning, esteemed panelists and guests. My name is Miguel Cabalza, and here with me is Carlo Velasco from 4AB Sociology. Here to present our thesis on negotiating disaster, understanding disaster risk management experiences of Marikina residents. So before we start our presentation, we would like to thank uh, our panelists today, especially Mr. John Delupa, who is actually in the, vo uh, the Zoom channel. We would also like to thank uh, Dr. Emma Porio, Dr. Justin C., and Dr. Bidik Nabalgos, who aren't able to be here today. Uh, we'd also like to thank Dr. Andy Sokorodla for guiding us all throughout this process. Okay, so starting off our presentation, in recent years, a growing literature on the Anthropocene has recognized the social, the social, cultural, economic, and political factors that affect our environment and consequentially our cities and societies. Uh, these include disasters that strike and destroy lives, businesses, and communities, making developments and research on disaster risk reduction management even more urgent. So Misanya and August 2015's uh, research show how the understanding of risk would ultimately figure in how a community responds and handles these disasters. So as the Philippines is located in, within the Pacific Ring of Fire and the typhoon, typhoon Belt, the country is a frequent site for natural disasters. According to Dangkalan, one of the regions frequently affected by severe floods is Marikina City, located in the, the National Capital Region. Okay, so 
here, presented here is a hazard hunter flood map uh, of a part of Marquina, with the darker partitions uh, being areas which are severely affected by floods caused by either typhoons or the Marquina River traversing the city. So with these risks, we want to look into how, a commit, how community members in Barranca manage risk. So our primary research question would be, how do the residents of Marquina construct risk as they negotiate disasters in their area? Along with this are three sub-questions, mainly how do the residents of Marikina generate meaning around disasters, how do the residents respond to disasters, and how do they perceive the sufficiency of the disaster response practices. We highlight, sorry, we highlight the experiences of individuals before, during, and after the encounter with, uh, with the disasters, as well as the, experience, as, as well as the ways they understand their experiences. So we, find, so we try to find the ways uh, so the study will, sorry, findings from the study will provide insights into the meanings of disaster risk as well as the negotiations of disasters that translate into particular responses and ultimately into disaster management. This bottom-up approach aid aims to add on to Dr. Porius' call in her 2021 research to expand literature that, that listens to the voice of the impoverished and or affected communities themselves. Moving on with the conceptual framework of the study. In this slide, we utilize Tierney's definition of risk, where it's the ability of society, which includes people, institution, infrastructure, the economy, and the natural environment, to respond to the potential of natural, natural or man-made hazards to det detrimentally affect society, whether eliminating hazards themselves or through managing its impact. Oliver Smith categorizes them into two. Uh, as, you see in, as you see above, it includes external variability and internal complexity. External variability includes the natural phenomenon that triggers disasters, it, its potential to impact society, and the severity of its impacts. Within the, in, uh, within the internal complexity of, of society, we integrated Satar and Chung to highlight four areas. With, uh, this includes socio-political relations, location, knowledge, and beliefs. So socio-political relations is the network of an individual to connect with other people, to receive information, and resources to respond to disasters. Location is the individual's proximity to hazards and, their res and resource distribution areas, such as emergency services and evacuation centers. Knowledge includes access to information on disasters and management strategies to respond. They can either be first-hand experiences or second-hand. Finally, are religious or, or secular beliefs people, that people hold regarding disasters. Explaining these two, both of them affect the construction of risk through a di dialectical or two-way relationship in creating experiences and the memories people have to disaster. External variability highlights how disasters are similarly experienced with one another, whereas internal complexity affects one's, one's perception of whether a disaster can be considered a disaster. With these experiences, these translate into how, how they respond and construct risk. Moving on with the methodology of the study. The study utilized a qualitative methodology and was implemented from January to February 2023. We utilized purposive sampling to acquire five, five participants that were aged from 40 to 60 years old and, and have been residing in Marikina for at least 15 years, ensuring that they have experienced at least one major disaster as adults. This included Ondoy in 2009. We conducted semi-structured interviews physically and digitally according to the preference of the respondents. Uh, the interview lasted for 30 to 50 minutes and data acquired from the interviews were transcribed and, transcribed and thematic coding was performed to categorize and analyze the responses. Okay, so among the participants, we found three notable events or junctures that were frequently brought up as they recollected disaster experiences. First, prior experiences, which include their previous exposure to, with a disaster, their past residence, and their experiences before or after moving in Marikina. According to the residents, prior experiences affect how a household prepares and manages a disaster, especially in the case of residents who had, who had experience or have lived in disaster-prone areas. Second, enjoy as a benchmark experience for both the residents and the community. Community, shifting the way that they prepare and react towards disasters as most of our respondents were flooded. However, res residents who've had prior experiences like Maria were able to save their belongings. 
On Toy Cut, the residents and LGU unprepared, with Maria mentioning how high risk groups like pregnant women and children were found roaming the flooded streets as evacuation centers were already full. Academic institutions were able to provide assistance post disaster to their social networking during uh, Ondoy and both Yul and Ulysses. Third, and as a response to this benchmark experience, typhoon and flood response were adapted to what, 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 to what happened during Ondoy. So according to uh, Angelica and Maria, respondents were more proactive in ensuring they were safe and prepared, highlighting the feeling of panic or pressure whenever a hazard could, uh, uh, could present itself. The LGU's proactive and progressive nature were, was also frequently mentioned, highlighting th their hand on their hands on nature before, during, and after a disaster. Okay. Understanding internal complexity and external variability in negotiating disasters, we highlighted we highlighted the ways that the residents manage and prepare for a disaster. First, general strategies in managing include pre-disaster monitoring through information seeking. So Janelle and Maria mentioned how this is how they seek and listen. Uh, this is how they seek and listen to information regarding a disaster, uh, usually through LGU's disaster response uh, infrastructure like sirens. Due to the high risk posed on their belongings, another strategy employed was to pack them in plastic bags and jar boxes. Post disaster, they would also prepare go bags which contained essential items like uh, food, water, and clothes. Second, practical disaster preparedness strategies. So these strategies include saving valuable items first with what valuable is being diverse depending on the social context of the respondent. Awareness to creating reference points which signify when they should start preparing and moving to a higher, less risky area. So despite this, a frequent notion was to properly regulate their practical responses as being overprepared would cost them strains economically. Lastly, emotional disaster preparedness which included mental or emotional ways uh, they respond and manage disasters. Notable in their preparatory measures, visualizing and anticipating possible effects allowed them to gauge what they need to, what they need to prepare for to practical means, such as packing up, preparing a disaster fund, and staying up to monitor the flood. Acceptance was also a frequent theme as they mentioned that, uh, as they understood the riskiness of living in a flood prone area, allowing them to focus on their energy on post-disaster recovery. Similar to this, residents were also found to repress, uh, repress negative and stressful emotions while avoiding conflict within the household, allowing them to stay calm as they reserve their energy for post-disaster recovery. Okay. So last of our primary teams, ease of recovery, uh, which we really highlighted the importance of disaster preparedness. Uh, with the aforementioned practical and emotional disaster preparedness strategies, residents acknowledge their strategies and systems as means to increase their human agency during disasters. An example would be how Angelica realizes that she felt, she still felt fear and panic uh, since some of her cognitive functions shut down while preparing. However, suppressing this allowed, them to, allowed her to stay alert during this disaster. Along with this, uh, reducing stressful emotions while performing practical disaster preparedness strategies allow Janelle's children to stay calm during a disaster, implying the notion that this can reduce further trauma while teaching her children how to manage disasters properly. Second is the importance of assistance, wherein all of the respondents acknowledge the significance of various forms of assistance from their social network and their community to better facilitate the recovery from a disaster, granting them access to resources including food, water, shelter, emotional, and financial assistance. So with the analysis of the study, the findings presented three themes which influence how they constructed risk, namely disaster knowledge, ability to cope, and recover, and predictability. The first and largest factor was a participant's disaster knowledge that, that, that extends to their experiences or the lack of experiences to disasters in their, in their respective home provinces. In their provinces, these, those who, who were frequently affected to the, by disasters have developed a more nuanced and effective strategies in managing disasters than those who had little experiences. This also includes knowledge on where to get aid, which includes uh, their family, their friends, workplace, and the local government. However, whilst this in translates to a higher perception of risk initially, in the long run, this translated to a lower perception of risk due to the confidence that they develop over their disaster response. Second factor is the ability to cope and recover from the impacts of a disaster. Whilst all of their participants were equally flooded, what differentiates one from recovering from, the, from a disaster is their individual perception of what was valuable to them. These included a diverse set of items that included uh, personal documents, 
uh, particular furniture and even pets. Losing less or no valuable items to them translate into recovering from a disaster being, uh, uh, being easier. However, in discerning whether something is valuable to them, their emotions played an important role in their ability to cope and recover. This primarily affects the emotional attachment they have over their belongings and their individual experience of fear to ensure that they are able to respond in an organized and timely manner. Finally, is the predictability of disasters to affect them. Accepting the reality of their exposure to flooding, the participants anticipate and subsequently prepare for them sufficiently. However, when their preparations were insufficient, they experienced stronger emotions that increased their perception of risk. Conversely, when they consider that their preparations were being underutilized or being too much for the disaster, they consider it as being overprepared, which translate into reducing their perception of risk. In addition to these factors in, construction, in the construction of risk, one important consideration to which we discovered is the space where the construction of risk happens. In our conceptual framework, we highlighted that, in, that this happens within the context of the society, where it is neg neg negotiated amongst individuals. However, the findings suggest that instead of constructing, constructing it socially, the participants construct them individually which highlights the role of, the in, of their individual agency taking precedence over a societal construction of risk. This means that society only provides the means by which the individual consider in constructing risk, but at the end of the day, risk is still individually constructed and really variated from one person to another. And with that, thank you for listening to our uh, presentation. May I now invite our examiner, Dr. Um, Dalipang, for, for your comments. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, again, thank you to the group for inviting me to be one of their uh, panelists. And I think we have Dr. Uh, Andy uh, Sokoroda here with us, also their advisor. Um, so I just have a, a couple of questions, but the rest of the comments will be sent to you uh, with your manuscript. Um, first of all, I'd like to ask more about the background of your interviewees. Were there migrants um, or were they uh, Marikina residents for a long time? Now, because you mentioned something about their previous experiences as determining how they assess risk. Now, because I... I think it's important for us to uh, contextualize that since you only have five. So that's the first one. I'd like to know, maybe share with us a little bit more about the, the, the background of your interviewees. Second, um, could you tell us um, maybe some ways, because you, you mentioned that uh, for these residents, Ondoy is a benchmark, which I think is something that uh, a lot of Metro Manila residents, particularly those in Pasig, in Kamanava, is, is, is a common experience. No? And I think it has become sort of a benchmark because we always look back. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about how these people estimate their, because you, say it, you said it's a personal estimation or appreciation of risk. Uh, what tools do they use? Which information do they subscribe to? whenever they make that determination that one is, uh, this situation is riskier than the other. So two, first one, the background of your um, participants and uh, maybe how, just briefly discuss to uh, tell us how those backgrounds contribute to the, the way that they appreciate risk, their personal risk when it comes to disasters. And I, I assume you're talking about flooding disasters or are you talking about disasters in general, including earthquakes? fires, among others. Then the other one is uh, just what are some of the tools or bases that they use to make those assessments? Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Dalupang. 
So for our the, for the background of our respondents, yes, uh, they were all from originally from the province. So at some point in their lives, uh, they eventually migrated to Marikina City primarily for uh, economic reasons or uh, the availability of economic opportunities. So one of our respondents were originally from Bulacan. Two were in um, in Bicol. One was from Mindoro, and one was from Davao. Then for the findings. So for our findings, uh, Ondoya's benchmark experience was more of like, uh, since the flood nga, it actually affected all of our respondents. Um, uh, the flood the flood water actually went inside their homes. They started to create, uh, let's say, uh, landmarks. Uh, during uh, subsequent for subsequent disasters, wherein if if the water started to reach a certain point in their homes, for example, uh, this house in Provident or their gate, they will start to uh, pack up their materials. Another way was that the uh, actually the LG the LG uh, was proactive uh, by installing more sirens and uh, by frequently monitoring the online. Yung online uh, Martina PIO sa face on Facebook and other social media networks. Yeah. Thank you. So just to summarize your second answer, they they rely on external indicators like your uh, sirens that tell you which alarm and also uh, which alarm, particularly Marikina River is already at because that's what the alarm is for, right? It's the level of the Marikina River and also the information from... Uh, uh, from the PIO, but just on uh, maybe just to uh, just sorry, I, I know we're pressed for time, but did you find something about uh, some personal estimation tools that they use? Like, for example, oh, um, because you said that on DOI is a benchmark, mm -hmm. did any of your participants mention that when they see the clouds looking a bit darker than it was on uh, when it was during on DOI or their? You know, experiencing rains that are lo longer than when it was during Ondoy, uh, and they would begin to see that as an indicator. Oh, this might be, you know, uh, less risky than Ondoy or more risky than Ondoy. Thank you. Actually, sir, in our findings uh, or during our interviews, once it started, it was free, they were frequently mentioned that once it started raining, they would stay up now. They won't really sleep so that they can just monitor um, the online and even uh, the landmarks that I mentioned a while ago. So they would start to look at their gate or this this house. Then once the water reached there, they would start packing up. Okay. Thank you. That's all for me. And for the rest of the comments, I'll just put them on your manuscript. Thank you very much. Good work. Thank you, presenters. Uh, unfortunately, the two other examiners uh, did not make it today. They will just send you their comments and feedbacks. Uh, now we welcome the second group of presenters. The research is entitled, The People's POV, The Effect of Perceived Value on Coral Reef Management and Conservation Activities in Mabini Batangas. Let's welcome Alexander Piolo L. Flores, Ryan Xavier V. Milana, and Leander Michael Angelo Uy. Supervisor, Ms. Justin Nicole V. Torres. The examiners are Mr. Rex Baler and Mr. Juan Miguel Torres. Uh, Seguro, while uh, we're waiting for this to, to start, um, I'd like to first uh, once again thank Ms. Justine Nicole Torres, without whose guidance we would not be here without. So thank you so much. And to our panelists who unfortunately couldn't make it today, um, one I think is trying to catch up to us, uh, Mr. Rex Barrer. And Mr. Juan Miguel Torres, thank you so much for your contributions and thank you so much for the invaluable insights that you've given us.
what is value? What may be valuable to one may not be, may be completely worthless to another. What is seen as something uh, economically sound to one may be an, a stupid investment to another. I'm sorry, I couldn't uh, put a picture, but take a look at this necklace. Maybe it's, it's a gold-plated necklace pendant that is worth maybe 1,000, 2,000 most. And yet this was given to my great-grandfather, to my grandfather, to my father, and now it's with me. To me, this is priceless. This is something that I will never let go of for as long as I live. Good morning, everyone. And we, today we would like to talk about specifically that value. Our research is entitled The People's POV, The Effect of Perceived Value on Coral Reef Management and Conservation in Mabini, Batangas. Next slide, please. Maybe give a round of applause to Sir Rex. <laughs> Hello, sir. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> First, an overview of the study. Number one, we will be going through a quick introduction, a quick overview of the study and the background of the study. Number two, we will be doing a review of our related literature. Number three, we will be doing a uh, overview of the frameworks that we employed throughout the study. Number four, we will be doing a quick run through of the methodology that we employed as we went to Mabini Batangas itself. Number five, our findings and analysis that we've gathered. And number six, our conclusion. Next slide. So firstly, I would like to introduce the study site, which is Mabini Batangas, which the note was picked because of its close proximity to all of us in the research, as well as it, as well as it, as well as the location putting importance on the diving, fishing, and tourism industry, having an abundance of diving and beach resorts, while also hosting a famous coral reef. This coral reef being part of the Center of Marine Biodiversity, also known as the Verde Island Passage, which is home to most of the world's coral reef fish and invertebrate species. Like most reefs in the world, Mabini, Mabini's reefs ecosystem is not free from pollution, global warming, and physical damages. Next would be tackling the research questions the study wants to answer. So number one, how do the different sets of stakeholders of Mabini Batangas value the corals in an economic, social, cultural, and biophysical sense? Number two, what aspects of the reefs do the different stakeholders appreciate? How do they show this? What benefits do they derive from this? And number three, how do the stakeholders think that the multiple values of the reef should be protected and or restored? Next would be the reasonings why we picked these specific barangays to focus on. So we wanted to make a sample set of Mabini Batangas as a whole. It contains a wide range of stakeholders. However, we had lim limited time and resources and we cannot cover the entirety of Mabini. The goals of this would be to understand the perspectives, interactions, and aspirations. Next would be tackling the, the uh, Lastly, I'd like to tackle the significance of the study, which its main theme being filling in the sociological gaps. These being scientific studies often leave out the social cultural aspects of the local communities. Understanding the sociological side of coastal communities helps create better discourse and compromises and to emphasize the importance of local cost coastal communities' perspectives of the coral reefs. Next would be tackling the review of related literature. Mostly the main themes that the research needs to focus on. First would be the damages inflicted onto coral reefs. So the most common being the destructive fishing methods, anchor, like anchoring and pollution. Another would be the standing of Batangas in regards to its fishing and tourism industries. So Batangas is ranked just second to Central Visayas in potential reef fisheries, while also bring in more than half a million tourists every year. Next would be defining what ecosystem services are, which obviously, be, which, is, which obviously is what the ecosystem gives as benefits to humanity. And defining provisioning, services, which is what the ecosystem offers in producing products for humanity, regulating services, what are the benefits obtained from the ecosystem processes, cultural services, these are the non-material benefits that are obtained from the ecosystems, and lastly, supporting services, the necessary services for the production of all services which indirectly impact human, uh, humanity. All right, so now considering the framework um, that we wanted to employ, we looked to three previous studies that tackled um, uh, ecosystem services, perceived value, and the application of such. Number one is by Dunlap and Catan. And it is a framework that illustrates that there is a complex relationship between the social complex, the people, and the environment, characterized by their ability 
to influence change in one or the other, as characterized by this framework. Next slide, please. Second, we look at Selamutu et al. and their framework about understanding conservation practices in the wetlands which they studied. And we were able to apply this in our, in our situation in Mabini, Batangas. Next slide, please. And finally, we looked at the social exchange theory of Schwab et al. And this basically highlights that there is a, ex that the exchange of values between the social complex of people and the environment produces value as derived from ecosystem services on the side of the environment and ecosystem stewardship on the side of uh, the people. Next slide, please. Um, I'm sorry for the sake of time, we will be skipping um, Schwab's proposition. We will be going back to it next. And this is the framework that we employed in our study. So as we can see here, we are the social complex of Mabini Batangas is represented above, and the coral reef ecosystem of Mabini Batangas is represented below. And these enter into a social exchange, which then produces a feedback loop, as, we, as, as, as can be seen on the right-hand side. And this allows us to produce a feedback loop that gives, uh, that gives, um, that gives us ability to improve our cons conservation practices, that it gives us the ability to give feedback to the things that we are doing wrong in terms of converse, cons, conservation and education about the coral reef ecosystem. Next slide, please. So now we'll be tackling our methodology. Next slide, please. Uh, for our research design, the study aimed to gather qualitative data on the perceptions and experiences of stakeholders in Mabini, Batangas regarding coral reefs and their conservation efforts. The data collected was analyzed using a theoretical framework presented in Chapter 2 to better understand the, com the community's perception of the value of coral reefs and how it affects conservation efforts. Next slide, please. For data gathering methods, uh, to gather necessary data, the researchers employed various methods, including on-site fieldwork, focus group discussions, and key informant interviews, and document reviews. For focus group discussions, uh, it's, uh, this research method aims to aim to gather in-depth information on stakeholders' attitudes, beliefs, experiences, insights, and perceptions. So open-ended questions were utilized to provide an explanation, clarification, and validation of the reasons for how these stakeholders value the color use of Mabini. This method was used when the interviews were already grouped up or when time constraints were present. For key informant interviews, the, uh, they were used to collect information from a wide range of stakeholders who have first-hand knowledge about the community and the topic. So the majority of the data gathering throughout the study utilized interviews as the primary data gathering method. And lastly, the document review. So the document review serves as our rich source of secondary data to determine past and present policies, programs, and other related initiatives of the LGU that influence evaluation. So it was guided by the research's main question and sub-questions and research objectives. Next slide, please. For research setting and respondents, next slide. Mabini is a coastal municipality known for its abundant marine life and beautiful dive spots. So figure F here shows uh, the map of barangays within the Mabini area. Uh, the study focused on Mabini Batangas, specifically in Barangay Solo. However, it was expanded to include barangays Bagalangit and Digaya at the recommendation of the Municipal Tourism Officer, Mr. Ian Bueno, to cover a broader range of stakeholders since Barangay Solo mainly, con mainly consisted of fisher folk. So our research focused on three stakeholder groups. We had the directly benefiting, indirectly benefiting, and local government officials. They were divided into three groups in order to demonstrate the nuances. Next slide, please. The researchers were able to initiate contact with these interviewees through, May through Mabini Mayor Nilo M. Villanueva, Next slide. And also with the assistance of the, of the Municipal Tourism Officer and Coastal Resources Management Officer, Mr. Bueno. The respondents were selected via proposals and snowball sampling. And these stakeholder, stakeholder groups will be further defined below. Next slide, please. So for the directly benefiting stakeholders, uh, this group includes those who derive uh, economic benefits from the coral reef ecosystems of Mabini. The, this group includes fishermen, scuba divers, and free divers. Through their interviews, we gained insight into the importance of coral reef to the local tourism and fishing industries in the barangays of Bagalangit, Ligaya, and Solo. For indirectly benefiting stakeholders, this group includes those whose livelihoods do not directly deal with coral reef ecosystems, with ecosystems but still receive other ecosystem services. So this group includes individuals like engineers and cafeteria concessionaires. So the importance of their perception and understanding of the coral reef ecosystem is critical to the effectiveness of conservation efforts. And last, we have the local government officials. This group includes individuals responsible for establishing local conservation practices and activities, and are those in charge of ecosystem stewardship. Through their interviews, we gained insight into the vital role of the local government in conservation efforts. So the study provided valuable insights into the importance of coral reef ecosystems to various stakeholders in Mabini. We, could like, we would like to thank our interviewees and the municipal officials who assist, assisted us in the research. Next slide, please. For instrumentation, 
So they utilize open-ended questions to gather data on the attitudes and beliefs of stakeholders towards coral reef conservation preservation. So questions were aligned to elicit detailed and nuanced responses from the participants while still allowing for the exploration of unanticipated ideas. So a full informed consent uh, form based on the University Code of Ethics and Research was created and then provided to all individuals uh, to, to all individual respondents of the study, with Filipino and English options being made available. All respondents were allowed the capability to render their full informed voluntary consent to the study. Next up, please. Yeah. So this is just a brief overview of the. Oh. So this is a brief overview of the people we were able to uh, interview. So the first directly benefiting being uh, dive instructors and a group of fishermen, residents of Mabini, and the indirectly benefiting benefiting in the LGU officers. That's right. So just a brief overview of the stakeholder groups and their characteristics. We had they share an, uh, the directly benefiting. They share an appreciation and responsibility for the coral reef ecosystem because of its economic importance to the industries. The indirect being they share an appreciation for the coral reefs because of its fame and influence over Mobini. And lastly, the LGU officers who hold holds responsibilities of being the leading figures to manage, safeguard, and improve the relationship of the coral reef ecosystem of Mobini and All right, so why did we speed run uh, all of our research? It's basically, it comes down to this. It's all about the people's perspective, the people's point of view on how they view their coral reefs. Because it is the perspective that differs between all, each stakeholder groups. We recognize that the, direct, the, the directly benefiting groups, for them, they highlight the spe specifically the provisioning ecosystem services. They see the coral reef system as something that they can derive their livelihood from. The divers, specifically the dive instructors and the fishermen, all relate to the coral reef ecosystem in an economic and almost um, symbiotic way that they, 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 they take care of them and they'll take care of me. For the indirectly benefiting, they highlight the cultural ecosystem service, that they see that this is a point where um, this is a something that their community can gather around and they do identify that the community does gather around, that they are proud to be called, um, it's funny enough that Mabini is uh, is less known than one part, the small barangay of Mabini that is known as Anilao. And that seems to take, take the identity of the entire region as a whole. And so the entire Mabini municipality gathers around this as a sort of um, identity for them. And lastly, the LGU who are, uh, the LGU officials who are in the very privileged and very, um, it must come with a lot of pressure, pressure, position to take care of this very vital source of their industry, of their ecotourism industry, which is the coral reefs. And so they come from the, they come from the point of view of trying to take care of um, their, their barangays. They try to take care as much as possible of the coral reefs, of the not just the coral reef, also of the uh, the coastal ecosystem in terms of uh, cleanup drives, in terms of the Bantay Dagat initiatives. Next slide, please. And so we constructed a ranking in terms of how um, these stakeholder groups perceive these ecosystem services in terms of the interviews that we got in terms of the general disposition and the, the attitudes they carried. We can see that the directly benefiting ranked them in such a way that the provisioning, regulating, cultural, and supporting are in that order. For the indirectly benefiting, the cultural, provisioning, regulating, and supporting are in that order. Lastly, the LGU officers see provisioning and cultural as tied together because on one hand, it's their job to take care of the coral reefs because it is the identity of their local government. Next slide, please. And so we can see that there is a social exchange in that each of these um, stakeholder groups receive a um, ecosystem service in a different way. It receive all of the ecosystem services in, a, in different ways with differing values. And as a result, they each take care of different aspects of the, of the ecosystem, of the coral reef ecosystem in different ways, thereby providing a, a holistic uh, ecosystem stewardship. And in this way, the social exchange is completed and the feedback loop continues. Next slide, please. Next slide. And for our conclusion, so what is it that we want to say? What is it that we are talking about when we, when we talk about the perceived value of coral reefs? Next slide, please. Going back to our research questions, with the, the ones that we were uh, hoping to answer. Next slide, please. It all goes back to the ecosystem services. Each person derives their value. Each person derives their um, appreciation or each person derives their, let's say, um, perception of the coral reef ecosystem based on the ecosystem service that they provide, uh, that they receive from the ecosystem. And as such, wait, can you go back? Back to, 
backwards. Anyway, as such, they in turn provide differently because of the differing inputs that they receive. For example, if it were up to the LGU, they, what, they would, what they would be focusing on are the uh, political side, the laws that apply to their core reef ecosystem. If it were up to the directly benefiting, it would be the scientific um, coral reef management the, based, on, based on and informed by their interactions with the community, uh, with the coral reef ecosystem. That is all. Thank you for listening. Thank you, presenters. Um, let me now invite our examiner, Mr. Rex E. Barrer. May I invite you, sir, to please come forward. Hi. Um, I have to apologize to the class, uh, first of all. Uh, I don't want to start the question in this context, but I really apologize. Uh, it's been two years since I've been last <laughs> on campus, so uh, I hate to admit it, and I'm embarrassed. No, wala ako. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, you referred to uh, impacts of climate change, in particular to the coral reef ecosystems in Mabini in general. Uh, in fact, you also referred to an event or events related to uh, coral bleaching uh, in your research, which has which actually occurred. There was one, for example, that occurred only during this past two years. You know, so it, it became a source of concern. Uh, it was difficult, particularly because there weren't a lot of people who could actually serve to support whatever actions that can be taken. Um, did that come out during your focus group discussions as well as your key informant interviews? And in that context, can you also sort of provide us on uh, the extent of appreciation in relation to the perceived value of the, of the corals to the members of the community? Um, in terms of our, <clears throat> I'm sorry. In terms of our interviews with uh, um, our stakeholders, um, coral ble ble the coral bleaching events were some not something that specifically came up, but this came up in our, our related literature, in our documents review. Po. And this is something that we highlighted um, in our uh, our our review of related literature. Po. And as for the perceived value, naman po, of the. Um, I'm sorry, the perceived so, value no, of the stakeholders. Yeah. So if, if it didn't come out, so there were never, there wasn't any question in relation to, let's for example, the potential impact of climate change. Because uh, going through your research, one of the most outstanding concerns that you raised during, uh, in, in your, in your write-up was that of, of climate change and, and ec ecosystem, uh, uh, services particularly would have uh, climate change or would have a negative impact on the ecosystem services that they are receiving now if you're not aware of say what uh, potential negative consequences of of such uh, a phenomenon would be then you wouldn't have a, a clear idea of what you can actually do to ensure that those ecosystem services would be available for you uh, sustainably. Okay. So it, it, we're not only looking at today, tomorrow. It's, it's not. It's it's not in that context. So, um, were, did you ask questions of your uh, participants, particularly on that matter? For example, uh, are you aware of climate change? Uh, no, so you didn't. You didn't ask them. Uh, yes, but our apologies. We overlooked that part. But. Right. So I mean, it it will never come up if you never ask questions, right? So just to be clear, because you you alluded to that, uh, and therefore, if it's in the research, then it would have been more uh, 
helpful, advantages for your research if you sort of went through the potential gamut of uh, events that can have a negative impact on those. Like, for example, provisioning as a sec an ecosystem service would be affected if you have uh, ocean temperature warming, ocean acidification generally, and whatever yield from uh, fisheries as a consequence of intact corals will likely not be there, say, even for a decade if um, your corals turn ghostly white. Okay? I mean, that, that, is always the, that is always the indicator, for example, of the temperature in, in your water going higher. If you lose whatever uh, resources you derive income economically uh, from those corals, then they don't necessarily get the idea of why those corals have to be preserved, conserved for the longer period of time. They probably appreciate it now because there's a yield and that's not to take anything away from them. But again, those things. Uh, Similarly, you also referred to, say, pollution, um, other practices. You know? So those things should have been relevant questions or points of discussion, because I'm pretty sure, particularly if you had a discussion with members of the Bantay Daga, that they will have an appreciation of that. Um, there are several marine sanctuaries, actually, within the area because uh, it's part of the Verde Island Passage. So, um, again, similarly, if you are not able to take care of those sanctuaries, the ecosystem services will not be available in the longer term. So th that's that's a point. Uh, um, probably the just second question, and, and, and I, that, that would be it. How many participants did you have for your focus group discussion? We had 11, too, sir. 11. Were these members of the focus group discussion largely representative of the different barangays within the municipality of Mabini? Uh, yes, they were represented by, because we had the first main stakeholders from the three barangays as the free divers, uh, the, the dive instructors and the fishermen, all coming from two barangays from the three. And then we had the residents that lived within Mabini, so that's another uh, area area of barangays. And then the LGU officers who also live. So the, the focus group discussions were divided geographically uh, with yeah. a mixture of uh, different uh, uh, stakeholders. The only or focus group discussion we had was the four fishermen because okay. they, they wanted to do as a group that again they didn't want to be disclose their information. Sorry, what was they that? didn't want to like, disclose their names long. That's why it was called Port Fishermen. But they, they were the only FGT we had. Okay. Because the others were solo interviews. The others were? All interviews. Uh, or interviews. Solo interviews. Okay. And how many interviews did you do? Seven. Seven. Seven interviews in total. Bro. And these were dive instructors? Two dive instructors. Bro. One, then the LGU officers, and then residents of Mobini. The residents of the community. Um, rough um, percentage of your three. Three out of seven. No, no, they were all. No, it's just they were all. No, so they were all from Mabini. It's just when we say the three residents, they were part of the indirect, indirect, no, the indirect beneficiaries of the reefs. So meaning they don't necessarily work within the, tur the tourism and fishing industries. But they all, all respondents here from Mabini Mabini. Okay. Uh, if you were, or if you had the opportunity to do this research again, what would be the aspects of this research that you will want to have done better? Uh, uh, of course, we'd want to have a bigger demographic. We'd also want to, like what you suggested earlier, we'd want to include then, uh, questions on how they value if, let's say, mawala nga yung calories or if they were to be damaged because of global warming or other causes. So that wasn't a big tackle in their interviews. 
because it is more of a valuation economically, mm-hmm. like what they really get from it when it's there. They're valuing in general. So that would be something that we'd want to tackle if we had the opportunity. Uh, more of the same, but more on, <clears throat> sorry, uh, we would, I would personally, uh, what I would have liked to do was to be able to spend a longer time. Uh, we realized that spending three, three days in one area is not really enough of a um, gauge of exactly how it is their conservation practices are executed. It's possible that they say all these things that we do these things, but in reality, the practice is not there. So um, something that we were not able to observe. So if we were able to do it again, I wish would have wished to do it uh, over a cons- some consecutive weekends or possibly over a longer period of time. If you have the opportunity to go down the, the different diving sites, you're coming, going back, I would really suggest you be able to do that yourself so that you have a more a deep, literally deeper appreciation of what the coral reefs are. So if you get certified as divers, I'd encourage that. Thank you, sir, Barrel, and thank you, uh, thank you presenters. We're now down to the third um, group under the same theme. I am now calling on the third group, composed of Almeya Mali K. Abad, Isabel Antonia N. Gales, and Gwyneth Berlin and Tantoko. The research is entitled, What is an Ideal Tropical House? Narratives of Homeowners and Architects. The supervisor is Dr. Fernando N. Zianzita. Their examiners are Ms. Maylin Q. Lissing, Ms. Cherry Audrey D. Alfiller, and Sir Eric Apedon. Okay, so while we're setting up, we just want to say good morning to everyone. And um, we're Almeo, Isabel, and Gwyneth Tantoko. And we will be presenting our thesis titled, What is an Ideal Tropical House? Narratives by Homeowners and Architects. And we would first like to extend our deepest gratitude and appreciation to, of course, our thesis advisor, Dr. Jalsita, and our reviewer who is here today, Ms. Mylene Leesing, and our other reviewers who are not here, uh, Mr. Eric Akpedonu and Ms. Sherry Alfiller. So our presentation flow will be as follows. Okay, so the Philippine climate is generally characterized by high temperatures and humidity throughout different times of the year. So the country has also faced increasing heat exposure levels as an effect of climate change. And as such, keeping cool as a means of thermal comfort is fundamental to the quality of life of residents, especially in tropical and subtropical climates. And recent times have seen the utilization of active cooling mechanisms in order to achieve immediate thermal comfort. And more than that, air conditioning is also seen as a status symbol in the Philippines. However, it holds certain challenges and negative impacts in terms of energy demand, climate change exacerbation, and the like. So the problem addressed in the research is, given that the Philippines is a tropical country where energy is expensive, what is the ideal tropical dwelling that Filipinos envisage? How do Filipinos define comfort in a dwelling? And how are these notions affected by their perspective as a homeowner, architect, and developer? So the study serves the main purpose of discovering the perceptions Filipinos have towards thermal comfort in their own dwellings. Climate change is a major area of concern, yet it still seems to be too technical and distant from the average homeowner who is more concerned with their direct experience of the daily weather. And given that air conditioning is assumed to be the primary means to achieve thermal comfort, the research aims to explain why passive cooling features are not widely advertised in the architectural design of modern homes in the country, given that they are a micro-level contribution to climate change mitigation. And it also aims to inspire sociologists to conduct further research into the relationship between humans and their homes, as well as inspire architects and developers to become active proponents of passive cooling features as it is a form of sustainable architecture. Now, as a framework for research, it's important to bring up the sociology of architecture. So this is defined by the sociologist Bugni and Smith as the application of social theory and method to the architectural design process. So this is an emerging subfield that draws on existing fields such as environmental psychology, ecological sociology, and community sociology. And its main purpose is to understand the relationship between people, communities, buildings, and natural surroundings. The sociology of architecture is vital in the exploration of addressing how buildings that human 
human beings construct speak about the state of society and the human identity, especially since both buildings and society continuously affect one another. This is most evident in domestic dwellings as this is the area where most socialization occurs. These provide good insights into the lives of the social group and community that instills a sense of physical space for understanding fundamental structures in the human experience. Overall, buildings and houses could help analyze interactions between objects in regard to the social life in order to curate an environment that is more humane and livable. So our literature review looks into studies which focus on perceptions of an ideal home, perceptions of thermal comfort vis-a-vis -vis one's environment, and Philippine vernacular architecture. And in summary, um, notions of an ideal home are constantly changing due to what is being popularized by society. And the Philippine context generally prefers a modern looking house that uses concrete over traditional materials. Next, comfort in indoor environments is generally perceived to be conditions that are cool compared to the outdoor physical environment. And there also exists a preference for air conditioning systems for indoor settings, but studies also show that homeowners prefer adequate daylight and proper airflow in their homes. And lastly, Philippine vernacular architecture, especially passive cooling features, is the best approach to designing homes that are responsive and appropriate to the country's tropical climate. So some observations from the literature review are is that there's little to no sociological literature on perceptions of thermal comfort. And next, sociology of architecture is a topic yet to be explored in the Philippine context. Uh, though despite this, there are rich discussions on Philippine vernacular architecture and passive cooling ventilation. So with our study, we aim to fill in the gaps by giving focus to Filipino perceptions of thermal comfort in residential dwellings vis-a-vis -vis one's physical environment. This would also contribute to the sociology of architecture in the Philippine context. So moving on to the methodology, the study is a qualitative study with a narrative approach and uses systematic analysis at its, at its main data processing method. So the narrative approach was used to, as it aims to gain perspectives from people, and the thematic analysis was applied to organize the data into themes and codes. For data gathering, key informant interviews with homeowners, architects, and developers were served as the main data gathering method. So we also did site visits to three different types of house settings, a detached dwelling, a townhouse, and informal settlement. This was done to evaluate if the homeowner's perceptions of passive cooling features reflect in their current house. We also had a total of 14 respondents, and the breakdown is seen in the screen. And three site visits, we were limited to one per subcategory since some homeowners felt uneasy with us visiting their homes. For the scope and limitations, our study is limited to the residents of the chosen site because of the following reasons. First is the convenience of the researchers. Second is the variety of houses in the area. And third is to discover the perspectives given the different manifestations of pollution in the area, and for is to observe the feasibility of passive cooling features in houses. All of the architects and developers in the study have experience in working with residential projects. So for our questionnaires, the researchers used three different questionnaires. So first is homeowners had a questionnaire that focused on the experience of comfort in their homes, their own perceptions of comfort, and where these perceptions are influenced from. And while the questionnaires for the architects and developers had similar questions, focused on their perception of comfort and the ideal tropical dwelling in their specialization. For the site visits, the following features were observed. Okay, so we will now present our findings and analysis, and as mentioned in line with the methods of thematic analysis, a codebook was developed and will be flashed on the screen, but please take note that not all of the examples or evidence are here. Okay. So the first is convenience, which is a trait that's greatly valued by homeowners. Um, they generally prefer low maintenance features, maximize functionality and user friendliness of the space. Next, restrictions, which, in which homeowners are forced to make decisions regarding their house designs based on what is objectively practical for their own usage or for the environment. And third is cost, which is regarded as a crucial factor when deciding what features should be included in the design of homes. Ideally, it should not cost much to build nor garner a high amount of cost in the long run. Next is open design. Homeowners prefer an open house design, meaning that it is spacious, flowing, and allows for natural lighting and ventilation. So they don't like the feeling of being cooped up, which being indoors may sometimes bring. Then we have air circulation, in which homeowners prioritize the ability for natural air to properly circulate in their homes. And as such, there's a general preference for high ceilings and large windows to accommodate for better airflow. And next is bamboo. So despite the widespread use of industrial materials like concrete, some homeowner, homeowners have expressed their interest in natural materials due to its benefits for passive ventilation. However, security and weather conditions are major factors that hinder them from using such. 
And next, you have combination of internal and external environment in which homeowners express their interest in bringing in elements from the outdoor to the indoor setting. And this may be a result of the COVID-19 pandemic in which the lockdown, um, people were restricted from leaving their homes and had to adjust their dwellings accordingly to make them more livable. And next, you have experiences in which homeowners are mainly influenced by their personal experiences as sources of inspiration for their ideal home. And this holds much weight in shaping people's perceptions as they retain what they absorb firsthand. Next is family discussions in which people have shared notions with their family members regarding comfort in an ideal home due to the home being a shared space with family members as well as the family-oriented nature of Filipinos. And lastly, we have inspiration in which home homeowners take forms of mass media such as social media platforms and reality TV shows as inspiration in shaping their perceptions as their exposure to this is relatively high given that they are easily accessible. Next up, we will be discussing the findings and analysis from the perspective of the architects and developer. So first is enthusiasm. So Filipino architects are generally enthusiastic about the rising realization that passive cooling features within domestic dwellings uh, is still applicable to the many houses in the Filipino setting. However, these Filipinos are not aware of these designs. It is also the architect's responsibility to inform clients on how they can benefit from passive cooling. Next is passive cooling features. This remains to be an important aspect of the Philippine architecture as a mediator for the tropical climate of the Philippines. Next is factors. The incorporation of passive cooling features in homes relies on multiple external factors. One such is budget allotment for the passive cooling designs. Next is conscious design. The effectiveness of passive cooling features is heavily reliant on the architect's conscious process of designing a house that not only interacts with its environment, but interacts with them in a sufficient manner that caters to individual factors. Next is client focus. The architects focus on translating what they know their client's perception of comfort to be into the design of their homes. However, the client's vision and perception must come first in this case. Next is the varying comfort. The architects state that the perceptions of comfort vary per client. Now we will go into the uh, commonalities and differences of the site visits. So for the commonalities, all homeowners would like a more open space. For homeowners of less space, such as the townhouses and informal settlers, they adjust by utilizing resources such as their interior and the features of their homes. The researchers also noticed that um, all three homeowners have a similar perception when it comes to being comfortable throughout the rainy and dry season. It is also mentioned that families mostly spend their time in the first floor due to its cool nature. During the rainy or wet season, the homeowners are comfortable with the lack of leaks and wetness as a major contributor to this. However, the researchers also took note that the lack of orientation is a feature in all the houses. Next are the differences in the site visits. So the homeowners in detached dwellings are um, have more freedom in choosing their home designs. Meanwhile, in contrast, Homeowners are homeowners of townhouses are limited to their design decisions due to the limited amount of open space. This is also an added constraint since ho all townhouse homeowners are meant to have the similar exter exterior. Next, homeowners in detached dwellings utilize features such as ceiling height and window size. Those in detached dwellings take note of their household orientation. And additionally, those in detached dwellings have foliage areas in their houses. Those in townhouses also utilize features present in their homes to make their living spaces more comfortable, such as window placement for cross ventilation, flooring replacements, and pinched roof overhangs. The informal settlers um, do utilize passive cooling, but this is compromised due to the cramped nature of their houses. They use other available parts of their house, for example, their balcony is a multi purpose area. So other than codes, the analysis is also separated into two main themes, which are the traits of an ideal tropical house and factors that shape the perception of an ideal comfortable house. So as for the relationship of comfort and architecture in domestic dwellings, the researchers have analyzed that Filipino homeowners have distinct notions of a comfortable house. Passive cooling features are also given emphasis with some homeowners showing preference for these features. However, despite their awareness of the benefits of the said features, Filipinos are generally dependent on mechanical cooling. Moreover, homeowners prioritize other prioritize more other features of the, house, of the home, which leads to compromising the use of these passive cooling features. As such, Filipino homeowners view a house for its functional and social value, and not only its aesthetic value. Next is that Filipino architects believe that a house that uses passive cooling features pr to provide thermal comfort is an ideal ho home for the Philippine tropical climate, as these provide good long-term effects in terms of cost and comfort. And lastly, conscious design from the architects is needed to guarantee the effectivity of passive cooling features. So moving on to the understanding of perceptions of comfort through the sociology of architecture, Filipino homeowners understand that the home is a shared space, thus establishing a social connection through the spaces that human beings inhabit. 
However, there is a varied understanding of comfort in relation to homes, where the connection between aesthetics and social phenomena is evident in the design choices of their houses. Uh, lastly, the value of social cultural interactions among homeowners is evident in the configuration of spaces that vary among domestic dwellings. Despite the differences in perspectives among homeowners of each subcategory, perceptions of an ideal home revolve heavily around their social relationships, making them somewhat similar. Therefore, the researchers have made the following conclusions. So for the ideal tropical home, according to Filipinos, is a structure that has gone beyond serving the basic purpose of providing shelter. It must not only fit the preferences of the homeowner, but must also be appropriate to the Philippine context. The incorporation of passive cooling in a tropical, in an ideal tropical home makes use of the natural physical environment and no longer heavily depends on artificial cooling. And furthermore, all spaces are maximized and have a purpose. Filipino definitions of comfort in domestic dwellings also vary. For one, is um, it should be able to make use of space to engage in social activities ranging from entertainment to gatherings. And the concept of comfort is also heavily based security. It should provide ample space and a sense of peace to each family member. In terms of thermal comfort, the house must stay cool in the face of the country's times of humidity. The notions of comfort among Filipino homeowners are reliant on the background and social interaction within as well as outside of the household. As for architects and developers, these notions are based on both their professional knowledge of design and their past experiences as practitioners. Going back to the sociology of architecture, this framework aided in the interpretation of a more inclusive understanding of how architectural design affects social relationships. Instances like conversations and experience experiences help cement these notions and characteristics in a truly Philippine context, making this specific instance relevant not just to the subfield, but to sociology as a whole. Highlighting the passive cooling features have that highlighting that passive cooling features have a space within the Philippine architectural design and are still considered effective despite their more modern counterparts. With this, we'd like to end our presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Group 3. And for the interlocution, may I invite um, Ma'am Lissing for your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Congratulations um, to the group and to everyone that's presented today. Thank you. So I have a few comments and um, questions. I'm just gonna go, I'm just gonna run through everything and then maybe you can answer everything after. So, uh, um, I noticed you mentioned in your introductory slide, humidity. Um, it might enhance your, your research if you delve on it even more, because I think humidity is something that is unique to our geographic location as a tropical country, and it's a big factor in the design um, of, of houses or, or dwellings. Uh, second, um, during the course of your design, did you ever come across the concept of a comfort threshold? Is there such a thing? Like, what what do you identify as comfort? What 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 is the idea of comfort for people? Um, where does it end? Where does it begin? Uh, okay. Um, then um, also, it might have enhanced again the content of your research. Um, again, this is just an opinion had you uh, included maybe the work or, or if you had um, examined or investigated the work of an architect who has actually uh, uh, focused on this kind of issue. For example, and this is the example that I give uh, because of my limitation, I, Francisco Manosa, um, who has uh, focused very much on vernacular architecture and interpreting this into the modern context. And he has made numerous uh, houses, um, resorts, uh, buildings that actually incorporate the, uh, the ideas of uh, Filipino vernacular architecture. Um, and uh, I kind of noticed that there was no such uh, reference in your research, considering that you're talking about this issue. Uh, and then uh, I have one question regarding the respondents. Why 14? And then finally, uh, you were, you mentioned, um, and it, it's a major part of your presentation and your research, the term passive cooling features. Uh, do you actually define and identify what these are? And that's all. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you, Ma'am Malin. Um, for the 14 respondents, it was actually, um, that's for the um, key informant interview. So we had, for the homeowners, it was three per subcategory. So um, three detached dwellings, three townhouses, and three from the informal settlement. And um, we had four architects, and unfortunately, only one developer in the interview. And then in terms of the reference to a house design, actually the architects that we interviewed gave us references to their works that had passive cooling features incorporated. But then I think it doesn't necessarily um, fit the, the standard that you gave in which they're consciously interpreting um, passive uh, vernacular architecture into the modern context because it was more of them incorporating it as part of their like modern style for design but then um really it was dependent on the clients like vision they still wanted like um air conditioning systems sorry mom did i answer all your questions or did i miss any uh, okay thank you um yeah the passive cooling um have oh yeah you... it's it's defined po in the review of related literature it just we didn't present it due to the time constraint uh, did you can you please let us know what the definition is and can you identify what they are thank you so passive cooling features for are like making use of the environment to uh, ventilate the house so these features for are uh, high ceilings pitched roofs and like using shading and the orientation of the house so that it accommodates the wind flow and the use of materials for like wood that are relatively cool. Thank you. Um, Jerry's actually sent her. Jerry Alfiller sent her comments. Let me just read. Um, first of all, the paper is direct and well organized according to her. Findings were insightful and the conclusion covered the main point, the key points of the study. Congratulations to the research team and their advisor. She said, she said the question problematic was rather clear. And then um, the review of literature covered relevant themes. Uh, she has questions, however, about the methodology. Were the interviews conducted online or in person it was clear that there are three house visits but but how was how are the rest of data gathering uh, how is the rest of the data gathering conducted okay um thank you Paul, sir. for the data gathering we utilized uh online interviews um, aside from the three house visit the, the only on-site um interviews we had were when we visited those uh, on-site houses. Okay. Then regarding the, the analysis, can the group further differentiate what is convenient and what is practical? Um, for practicality, sir, it was more of like um, how they use the space. So for example, we had a respondent who said that um, the house needed to have a space for each member of the family or another respondent said that they wanted their layout to be more open because they didn't like walls um, closing off certain parts of the house, like the kitchen, like dividing it. And then um, also in terms of like material, as we mentioned, um, the use of bamboo, the mention of bamboo. So people aren't able to use bamboo and like in the provinces as much as they want to because um, it's a matter of security and also of the weather. So another example for security was also the um, certain types of windows and also the material for windows. Some of them are not really safe for Quezon City, especially because of um, breaking and entering. Some windows are like easy to access. Okay, uh, there's another question here. In this section on shaping perceptions of an ideal comfortable house, there was this item too. Homeowners construct their notions of what makes a comfortable house based on their interactions with their family members. How? 
uh, were there mentions of, of uh, who influences their decisions? Okay, uh, thank you, Paul, for this. Um, based on the interviews that we had, a lot of them, our majority of the respondents are really highlighted that it's not only supposed to com be comfortable for me, but also for my family. So um, they actually, the, a lot of their perceptions came from discussions or uh, discussions with their family members, discussing what they would like in their homes and discussing their perceptions. So um, these conversations, uh, very much um, influence what they perceive to be a comfortable house and comfort in general. Um, how about another question is, um, is the one paying for the construction important as an influence? Um, actually, we didn't exactly ask about that, Paul, because we wanted to avoid all questions like that were finance related but i think in general it does especially because the um, uh, relevant code that came out in the findings were cost so a lot of the homeowners um like it was reliant on who's paying for the construction because they want certain features like it's dependent on who who wants who's paying since they're the ones funding the building yeah. Uh, uh, I think that well, like, was more highlighted in the architect's answer since like, they have to cater to the needs of the end user. And I think one architect mentioned po na parang, uh, it depends talaga po on the budget of the end user and like, on what features they are able to use for their house. Okay. And finally, uh, well, this is her comment at the end. I would add that the ideal house, home, it's not just functional, but based on the responses, especially of the informant from the inf informal settlement. Spaces were also multifunctional. Her comment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zosita and Ma'am Listing, and thank you as well to our presenters. We're now down to the second cluster, which is three aspirations, allocations, and collective recalcitrance. The fourth group is um, composed of Dale, Andrew, G. Dakanay, Wilhelm Wingard A. De La Vega, and Angelica Nicole C. Tan. The supervisor is Dr. Wilfredo Torres III, and the examiners are Prof. Mary Rosales, Dr. Anna Marie Caraos, and Dr. Lisa Lim. The research is entitled Inventory Conditions of Community Organizing in the Philippines, the Case of Zone 1 Tondo Organization, or ZOTO. So thank you very much. Um, Again, thank you very much to the guests as well as the uh, panelists, fellow researchers who are present here today. Um, as uh, mentioned, we are here to present the contemporary conditions of community organizing, uh, particularly the case of Zone 1 Tondo organization. Uh, myself, Dale Andrew Dakanay, uh, Angelica Nicole Tan, and Wilhelm Wingard de la Vega to present. Uh, we'd also like to thank our panelists, uh, Dr. Mary Rosellis, who is um, in her time zone right now uh, at night. Uh, oh, via Zoom, uh, Dr. Liza Lim, who is present in the venue, as well as uh, Dr. Anne Marie Caraos, who could not make it today because of uh, prior commitments. And with that, I uh, would like to begin. So everyone, before we start, we would like to give basically a nice context or the setting of what Zone 1 Tondo organization is. Um, so the Samahan ng Mamamayan Zone 1 Tondo organization, uh, Zone 1 Tondo organization or SM Zoto is one of the first examples of community organizing from the process of Alinsky that was dated in the 1940s, wherein people um, themselves were able to identify issues and create um, more creative means of confrontation and finding solutions to communal, uh, community issues. Um, 
Zone 1 Tonto Organization was created in the 1970s. Um, and basically, people were able to build their own capabilities and um, prove that they can be a formidable foe to a government that condoned in human terms of eviction and demolitions. Um, in their 53 years of experience, this has resulted in the governments becoming more collaborative, supportive, and consultative partners um, with community organizations. And Zota has learned of the ideas of finding um, positivities and diversities in their communities and partnerships as well, while um, um, while being while learning the lesson of alienation in its members um, that must be hindered, uh, that, that can hinder their movements, and they learn to balance, and in their time, they learn to balance capability building, uh, gaining legitimacy, and participation in movements of change. Currently, it operates around the NCR area and its surrounding areas as with 28 local chapters. Um, through their rights claiming and rights-based approach, they hope for a vision of a community of economically and politically empowered citizens who are accorded their due dignity, fostering gender equality and democracy, and live in a healthy and bountiful environment. This particular research manuscript or thesis is guided by two main features. Uh, first and foremost, our conceptual framework, which is uh, defined by three major points. First and foremost, participation, which we describe as people-centered and people-based activity. These are uh, this particular framework is based on Sol Alinsky's work from the 1940s, and we have innovated it to account for both recognized community issues and two more variables we'd like to process. Uh, the first variable would be the structural change, basically social, political, and economic shifts that affect and influence Zoto as well as its members, uh, even beyond uh, the organization itself. And finally, the empowerment, or really the effectivity of their capacitation, whether or not Zoto is able to uh, equip its members to actually address and uh, identify said issues that uh, they recognize. Uh, the second feature uh, that will guide this particular thesis are the four research questions we've uh, laid out here. First and foremost, asks the current problems. Uh, what are they? How do they identify them and how does it affect them? Secondly, the implementation of their projects. How do they execute? How do they plan? And how do they organize? Thirdly, how they consider these projects successful and which of the projects they need uh, points of uh, improvement? And how? Uh, what are the reasons for why they believe that these things are successful or need improvement? And finally, we ask whether or not their suggestions on how they uh, push forward for the coming years. Moving on to the methodology, our group was able to visit three out of the 28 chapters that Zoto has. The Katagatan in Navotas, Bagong Silang in Caloacan, and Taroville in San Jose del Monte, Bulacan. We were also able to interview 25 participants through a mixture of semi-structured focus group discussions and individual interviews. We ended up with a good variety of members, community organizers, chapter heads, and executive rank members of Zoto. This brings us to our next part, the results and discussions. Listed on the slide are some of the issues and projects that Zoto faces along with the practices that they use to mitigate the issues that they deal with. We'll start with our case studies first. Um, this is our first case. It starts in the area of Navotas where the Zoto's main office is. Um, when talking with one of the community organizers um, whose one of their main jobs is to expand upon the area, um, we learn of um, the Save Navotas Alliance, also known as Sana All, um, who are aiming to find solutions to um, the threats that the community is feeling, starting with the land reclamation affecting fishing industries, a lack of government intervention um, for victims of water waste, and a plan for a 6,492-watt liquefied, uh, liquefied natural gas power plant um, by the San Miguel Corporation without any um, consent of the residents as it is placed inside the residential area. Um, in their investigations, reports of cordon off areas, 
Miss plans for housing, even uh, even an airport, were in the works. And currently, there is an appeal by the SMC to forego their um, negotiations and contracts and move up the price of electricity for the res its residents. Um, after speaking with the community organizer, we were given photos of how they were able to mobilize the day after, <laughs> um, showing how they um, want to raise awareness to the issue and actually create spaces where people can be more collaborative in the places that they live in. The second um, case that we have is in, located in Tonda, Manila, where the origin of Zota is. And when talking with the members, the work never stops and the issues continue to unfold and multiply. Um, during the Duterte administration, <laughs> Um, the issue of extrajudicial killings became a community concern as unjust practices left families scrambling for justice as houses were raided by plainclothes officers, belongings were looted, and suspects were riddled with bullets. Despite connections allowing Zoto to extend support financially and through its networks, Zoto also created support groups and documenting sessions to sort the grief, grief out for its victims. And Create, prepare the families in the time that the opportunity arises that justice can be found. Um, next, please. Our fourth case is in Towerville, Bulacan. Um, Towerville is relatively new to um, Zota as it is a relocation site during the early 2000s and 2010s. During, the 20, uh, during 2010 was a milestone for Zota as they were able to build this building over here called the Towerville Community Development Center where they created safe spaces for women and children, daycares, health, and maternal centers. Imagine 50 peso checkups and one peso paracetamols for people who needed it. Um, however, the financial burden of covering expenses for its members took a toll on Zota, and in 2017, the program had to be shut down. However, the issues in the relocation site continue to persist including the poor quality of provisions in the area from water, job availability, security of housing, um, birthing, even more of issues, uh, birthing even more issues affecting the families in the area. The local chapter has much, much to do. Um, however, they're taking things in stride, funding to support um, training sessions to equip women on issues on violence against women, the poster on the right. Um, human rights and certain legislations around the, uh, around the topic. Despite all these issues, leaders are proud to equip their members um, and take the first steps in confronting these issues once again. One of our final case studies is, uh, if you will allow me to share an anecdote for a few seconds, is uh, the pictures shown here are from an engagement that we had with Zoto uh, in coordination with the mayoral elect of uh, Caloacan City at the time. This was during Women's Month, and the advocacy event uh, was led by a particular political family in Caloacan, with Zoto being uh, occupying, actually, uh, almost 50% of their participants uh, in, that, in that event. Now, we'd like to use this as a perfectly solid example of how Zoto is able to play the political game, particularly in how they're able to um, collaborate and coordinate with uh, the members of uh, local government units and uh, national government. Here we see uh, two particular outlying uh, principles that Zoto has when they look for partnerships, where regardless if government or non-government, first and foremost, it is the mutual beneficiary of uh, each um, organization. Here, the LGU uh, finds Zoto's participation, its attendance in this uh, event as uh, crucial to the success of the event. And in return, uh, Zoto can trust the LGU to provide uh, services to lobby their advocacies should Zoto need it. The second one is an, an alignment of their advocacies. Now, um, given that I have mentioned Kaloakan uh, is technically uh, under the rule of a particular political family with Zoto uh, coordinating or collaborating with them, Zoto still finds this, this as a beneficial and necessary uh, collaboration since uh, to some degree they still uh, align the advocacies of both the LGU as well as the organization itself. Now within an area, Zoto has these local organizations that are formed with the help of a community organizer. With 25 residents, an organization is formed with a leader usually taken from the group. The organizer also immerses themselves into the area, forming possible alliances to confront community issues with the end goal of expansion. Multiple local organizations are then assimilated into a local chapter, which encourages project 
participation, maintains relationships, and creates appropriate policies and projects for the area. Above these are the regional heads and communities, which provide the general direction and policies and amendments for plans of action while also monitoring and evaluating various activities that involve internal and external relationships. Next. To generalize further and uh, further understand what uh, Will has just mentioned, it is uh, critical to understand uh, the understanding of a com community organizing through three particular touch points that Zota creates for both non-government, government, and its members. First and foremost, touch point is how Zota is able to hold uh, its regular meetings with its members. That is, they're able to um, uh, go, go down to the, to the membership level, uh, virtually eradicating barriers of hierarchy that make them... Uh, that creates strong organic ties that the organization uses to push forward in its advocacies. The second point also uh, in relation to government uh, units is that they do not shy away from uh, pinpointing critical government uh, gaps and uh, issues should they need be. Yes, they collaborated with, the, with uh, the government. Yes, they seek uh, consultations with them, but they do not, uh, are, are not afraid of, uh, of pointing out insufficiencies and inadequacies should the government need it, which is also connected to our third touch point, being how Zoto sees some actions still uh, persisting as, uh, in government as unfair and unjust, uh, citing with some members citing, especially in Towerville, Bulacan, uh, some practices by government that uh, still persist, such as demolitions and evictions, uh, that they still try to contest, that they still try to resist. So we personally found the concept of gut issues to be an important concept to frame the current state of community organizing in Zota. As an urban poor community organization, they weigh the feasibility of projects and proposals, often finding issues in finan uh, financial and logistical issues. Um, and unless they are supported by like-minded partners with the same advocacies. Leaders often have to sacrifice even at their own expense to help out their constituents. However, it is the same considerations of gut issues where people bond and form, its, uh, form ties to find solutions, while remaining empathetic that everyone is also trying to provide for their own families and cannot commit to the same things over at, at the same consistent pace. Uh, the tenacity paired with empathy make capable members able to handle any dispute and issue. We'll now move on to Zotto's threefold plan. Um, of course, it starts with res uh, resilient adaptability. Um, with Zotto being able to identify their current issues, it would be um, proposed that they also must keep with the times by using more contemporary technologies and processes that may be able to alleviate the persisting issues that they have as a community. In connection to the resilient adaptability, this can only be achieved as, uh, as Zoto observes through an institutional consolidation. What do we, may, what do we mean by this? Is uh, the, the academe's part in, uh, in narrating as well as uh, documenting the role and uh, the importance of Zoto. What's striking that uh, Zoto mentioned during our interviews is that they have no uh, shortage of the vernacular, but they need formal institutions and formalizations of their structures in order to persist and to continue their uh, advocacies. And lastly, now, systematic security refers to Zoto ensuring that their practices allow their community members to be empowered, remain empowered, and spread that capacity towards other marginalized urban poor groups, while also ensuring that their systems are sustainable. And to wrap this all up, I give this back to Dale. Uh, previous studies have concluded uh, how Zoto is in its weakening or in its decline in, pre in, in studies that have uh, uh, originated since 2000s. And this thesis aims to uh, contest these beliefs that Zoto is in a, in, in a particular decline. Rather, Zoto is actually strengthening. Zoto is actually expanding to some degree that it is continually persisting. It is continually strengthening, regardless if um, whether uh, previous studies had found, uh, it, which is a product of their time, of course, but as we have this, as we have researched and as we have found, uh, no, uh, we contest this uh, idea that it is weakening or in a decline, but rather it's in a strengthening and upward trend. Thank you very much. Thank you, presenters. May I now invite Prof. Mary for her comments and questions. She is connecting via Zoom. Yes, good morning. I think it's morning here. It's here evening. Uh, let me say I'm really delighted to be present at this um, important presentation on SOTO because as the uh, presenters have pointed out, a lot of research is available, written and so on, published on the first 20, maybe 40 years, but they correctly chose to focus on 
the 21st century mainly, and that's even up to the, the previous administration. So I think that's a genuine contribution because there isn't that much yet done. And I think they have brought that out, um, not only for Soto, but for a lot of community organizing along the same principles that Soto has pursued. So I do compliment you on that. Um, let me just add that I'm delighted that your presentation, you actually spoke to the audience and you didn't read a paper a mile a minute, which doesn't communicate much. So you're, I congratulate you just on your personal presentation, which I think connects with, I think connected with the audience uh, uh, well. All right, let me make um, some other, you know, just questions, I guess, really. Um, you mentioned some in passing that there was a time from the time they were very strong in the first decades that they were organized, but there was a shift and they declined. And in the, con in the text, you sort of say that, but you don't really explain it. And I think we have discussed this before. There, the issue of the leftist present uh, part Soto became very dominated by the late 70s, by the leftist uh, groups. And that who then would bring the larger structural issues and not structure as you mean it, as more institutional changes, but you know, the social structure of society. And, and, and but then you point out later, it came back because the, the leaders then subsequently began focusing on local issues again, and then people came back. I think you should emphasize that. I mean, you know, we're not condemning or the left. In fact, the left they had done a lot to generate uh, um, spontaneous, you know, the interest of the community. But that dimension, that political dimension, I think is very important as part of their trajectory. Uh, how in the end, they, they felt that, I think they haven't lost uh, the overall structural change society needs. They are aware of that, but they also know that it, you know, if you don't work with government as it is, you're not going to succeed very far, especially when government became open. When it was the first Marcos, there was no way they could work with the government other than conflict confrontation, but some negotiation. So I think that trajectory emphasize it more because uh, it's, I think, a very important part of their development. They haven't rejected the, the well, it's not really Marxist, but you know, uh, the leftist orientation, but they insist, they realize that if you don't get to the, the daily issues that people face, it's not going, nothing will work. Okay, so that's the first, I think, major point. The second is, you never use the term PO uh, that I recall. And in the Philippines, in general, when you're talking about informal settlements and organized communities, we speak of people's organizations. Of course, that's when they're organized, like SOTA. And there are many now throughout the Philippine cities. We, and you speak of POs. That's in the language of civil society today. And it's distinguished from NGOs. You, you distinguish that. Huh? So I, I, you know, Mention it's not just community association. It's a, a PO means it's organized, right? That's the second point. The third is you don't mention significantly the significance of the women leadership. Now, I, I don't know what the situation of Soto is now vis-a-vis -vis the gender side, but from the beginning with Trinidad Herrera, she brought out and she brought women into leadership positions. Males are also there. But they begin, the organizers then, and they themselves, found out that you could really rely on the women who were less interested in you know, deal, making dealings with politicians, which is the male role in society. But they were interested in the community. And so that's why the women leaders prospered and they learned how to do conflict confrontation negotiation and very proud of themselves. So, you know, don't, don't underestimate or uh, you, sh you should mention uh, uh, the, the role of women leaders, although I, I must say I haven't kept up with what's the situation now, but certainly in the trajectory, that was uh, very significant. Um, one, all right, a question I have for you is, who are the COs or who are the community organizers? Huh? They must be, 
paid, I suppose they're paid by somebody, unless they're local community organizers who are doing this, you know, because they're part of the community. But usually you separate the COs from the local leaders, right? Because the COs have a special kind of training, how you negotiate, how training, helping people to know, you know, how you negotiate, how to facilitate meetings, etc. So who's paying the CO? I mean, how are they getting that? Are they raising their own money and paying the COs, which would be quite spectacular, you know, quite significant uh, as, as a process uh, of, of controlling the directions they want to go toward. Um, let me see. Uh, when you, you know, I, I think you really have to clarify better when you say structure, ch structural change. You know, in sociology circles, structural change is really the whole structure of society, usually. Uh, and sometimes that may be appropriate here. But many times, the kinds of issues they were raising were institutional changes, getting NHA to lower the cost of, you know, uh, of the housing that they might be getting. Those issues, just changing the structure, of, structure of institutions and institutional operations is really what they have mainly been doing, right? The, the bigger structural change is somehow maybe happening, but, but their activities are institutional changes because they can target NHA, you know, uh, no, no relocation now until if we have to be relocated, you wait until March or when school is over and they demand that. That's institutional changes and they're important because it forced you know, the, the, well, NHA and others, the institutions to respond. Well, I think there are many other things, but there, I guess you have other commentators. So let me stop there and, um, and say that I do appreciate very much the study. I thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rosales, to note uh, as well. Definitely, it's as Dr. Rosales says, um, uh, a lot of uh, community, uh, community leaders within Zoto, I think, uh, Almost all 25% of our, oh, but no, almost three fourths of our participants, the 25 participants that we had were women leaders. And uh, it is a very critical observation that we really need to make uh, when it comes to the trajectory, even uh, the point that uh, Dr. Rosell has made on regarding uh, the, the, the trends from uh, its strength to its no, non strength to its back to its strength, or the leftist kind of. Uh, um, Structure that we also want to look for to look for in uh, in analyzing this particular um, organization. With regards to the question on CEOs, it's a very interesting finding that uh, the community organizers in Zoto, particularly in Bulacan, uh, Dagat Dagatan, as well as in Kaluokan, um, Bulacan, and uh, Dagat Dagatan, a lot of these C uh, CEOs were local, and uh, no, all of these CEOs are local. They were members of their own communities, as well as uh, the, the money, I believe, used to pay for the community organizers with these experiences are generated from the local community itself. Uh, the local have uh, micro businesses, I believe, that uh, is contributed by a lot of the women leaders, as well as the leaders itself, as well as uh, concessions from the LGU that they used to pay uh, the community organizers. Thank you very much. Yeah, great, yes. Uh, perhaps the other members uh, may want to ask or may want to respond. We also have one more panelist of Lucas, but um, to add to this, lang po, in regards to the history of a lot of the community organizers, they were from Zoto. Um, sometimes they tend to move from um, area to area, um, finding like um, a place to. Um, basically, yung sinasabi po nila sa amin is natutulog po sila dun sa area na yon para malaman po nila so that they know and identify and live in the same issues that they experience. So, um, currently, there are actually talks about honorariums and pays for a lot of the leaders, but it depends per chapter basis. Um, in regards to women leaders, po, I, or at least women participation, uh, a lot of our interviews actually talk about how women are very, very much necessary inside the organization as they tend to be the ones at home and they can identify the issues and they kind of, it is in that same solution finding way na gumagawa po sila ng paraan para makahanap po ng um, way to negotiate or a way to make do with what is available to them, which is necessary given the context of an urban poor community organization. 
Thank you, Prof. Mary. And now may I ask Dr. Lisa Lim for her comments and questions. May I invite you, Dr. Lisa, to please come forward. Thank you very much. Um, uh, well, firstly, I would like to express my gratitude to the three of you. Uh, as you know, uh, pursuing case study of SOTO is something that I'm interested in because of the history of our own organization, which is intertwined with SOTO. So but having said that, uh, I also uh, found it uh, good in a sense that I am reading the paper uh, that you wrote because I, I realized that SOTO has persisted in the works of the urban poor over the years. Uh, and I believe that being able to document that, uh, the history of the organization vis-a-vis -vis the urban poor social movement is a significant contribution already. As Dr. Roselis has mentioned earlier, uh, after the uh, no, after your first, uh, no, first phase, including probably last administration after that we have not heard of soto anymore not not in, in in the sense of analyzing how it fared over the years which is why my interest uh because there's not that much documentation of what happened in the earlier people's organizations that have been organized uh from 1950s to 60s up to now and it was good to hear that they still survived Having said that, uh, there are some comments and suggestions that probably um, maybe if the group can address it, that would be, that would be good. First is that uh, I was hoping that uh, in, instead of the summary of the content of the paper in your introduction, uh, I was hoping that you could have indicated uh, what uh, that studying uh, the recent organizational development of SOTO, um, what did you find out? I mean, why, why did you pursue? Uh, why did you pursue this? And what is the role of community organizing in it? Uh, because I think that this is very important. The history of SOTO is also some kind of a history of community organizing in the Philippines and how it changed over the years. Um, you also mentioned, in fact, that it's been interesting to note that SOTA survived, and that some of the people's organization uh, that belongs to it uh, are still there. And I think this is already very significant, considering that many of the networks and uh, people's organizations uh, have already died at this point, uh, or they have lost their, no, they have lost their steam, so to speak. Uh, and here, I think, you might want to also elaborate a little bit on the style of organizing that they use and the horizontal networking that they adapted. Uh, you actually discuss this in your paper. But you might want to strengthen a, a bit of that uh, because somehow in the discussion of the issues uh, that those points kind of got lost a little bit. Uh, so maybe you might want to just strengthen it a little bit. Uh, second, also, I would like to reiterate the suggestion in your earlier presentation that you locate the case study of sort in the literature of the urban social movement and urban poor or informal sector organizing and networking and alliance building. I do note that you cited the works of Dr. Roselis and Dr. Caraos. Uh, but somehow, I was hoping that you would this discourse the experiences of SOTO with those literature uh, and highlight how SOTO actually navigated through the different issues that have emerged in the recent times. Uh, I was asking, because I was, I was kind of hoping that you would do historical analysis and then try to um, pursue the history of the organization at present and how it changed over the years. Probably also looking into what changed, what, uh, of course, the issues in the environment has changed, but what changed also in terms of the focus of SOTO, why they changed the issue, why they changed the issue focus, and what kind of strategies also that they use. Uh, for example, I would like to know 
how and why they incorporated other issues like gender, uh, environmental issues into their work, why, and how it also helped uh, Soto in terms of uh, strategizing organizationally, okay, in, in, in light of this. Because I do, uh, as an organizer, I, I also do know that sometimes you go to gender and environment, primarily also because there are certain organizational uh, ano, organizational considerations that you need to make so that you'll be able to address the issues at that time. So it might be good to link it to the history. Like, for example, in the first phase, they are, uh, they are focused on uh, maintaining their tenure. And in the second phase, they want housing. Third phase, they want community development, and so on and so forth. How, the, how did it change? And how did it affect also the organizational structure of the organization itself? Um, and I feel that if you do that, then you can provide us with more insights on how they negotiate with other stakeholders in the community and how these have contributed also to their resiliency and sustainability as an organization over the years. Uh, you, you provided us a little bit in a little bit of those in some parts of your paper. But maybe you can elaborate it a little bit more. Um, might also be nice if you can explain a little bit also of your schematic diagram. Because you mentioned that this is, uh, you modeled it on, uh, under Alinsky, but you added uh, some other uh, aspects of it. Uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on those. Uh, because I was trying to look for handle also in terms of how I'm going to link the schema, the, the conceptual framework with with your analysis, so that I I kind of want to see a little bit more. Um, but overall, however, I think the discussion of community organizing was actually good, and I think the students also have done a good job in integrating uh, with the organization itself. Uh, you can see it in your paper. I, I, I can see that you did interview them, you interacted with them, and uh, it enabled you to at least uh, get very rich data, particularly in terms of how they deal with issues and concerns and some aspects of the organizational culture that they have. I was interested in your note on leadership. Uh, what was that that they said? You leadership uh, being able to, ano, yung, ano ngayon, the use, use particular lambing. word? Lambing. Lambing, okay. Uh, the lambing part. Because that's, that's a strategy. But that you use in the community, it can be elaborated. And uh, at the same time also, uh, it can enrich the concept of leadership and also uh, successful strategies that they did. But overall, I think uh, the paper is very rich, and I would like to congratulate you for that. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lee. Anyone from the group? Hello, Dr. Lim. Um, actually, I think uh, quite a bit of the debates within our group is how we would like to present our data. Because given the fact that we worked on a photo book doing the chronology of the history of Zoto, um, uh, we ended up finding out a lot more about what happened and what was missing. Um, an issue nga lang po is if we were to do like a full chronology, there's going to be quite a lot of holes missing because um, unfortunately the Zoto office was flooded um, in the 90s, or I believe. So we're missing a big like two decade chunk of documentations from them that like we believe would make for a, a very insufficient paper. So uh, we will, I think we will expand upon uh, quite a few cha changes because that's actually one of our research questions. Like what did you notice has changed in Zoto during your time here? And then why did these changes happen? Um, the adapting to certain advocacies and then why they believe it's necessary to have things like environmental um, awareness and uh, gender sensitivity is something um, actually a lot more personal to them rather than an external, um, rather than from an external source. 
we do have excerpts from that. Ayun nga lang ho. It's just trying to get everything condensed into a paper. It was quite a bit for us. Uh, it's as Jelly says, um, in recognizing their community issues, a lot of the times these are identified and um, uh, recognized by the, the, by the community leaders themselves through narratives. Um, Zoto's members particularly raise these concerns because they experience it, because they live it, and because they live and experience these things, they raise this uh, to Zoto's leaders, particularly to, uh, their, lo uh, to their uh, local chapters, uh, and then to the more regional chapters of Zoto, uh, thereby creating like a, a loop, really, of, uh, of uh, the, the issues that the community finds itself in, and then they bring it up to uh, uh, the the organizational tree of Zoto. Actually, you don't need to discuss those details. Maybe just the, you know, parang, uh, I, was, I was looking more along the lines of just the highlights. Uh, for example, in this particular era, ito yung, ano, ito yung issue. And then this particular era, this, this has emerged as a sign of the time, so to speak. Uh, so, and then how, how did they, how did they change also because of that. And I would assume also that over the years, there might be some changes also in terms of the organizational structure of SOTO. Uh, like maybe before, they only have a few chapters, but now they have expanded to other chapters. Uh, and why also, what happened? Because some of the personal things that they share with you might be also an indication of quote unquote, the sign of the times. And it, it, it was such a logical imagination. <laughs> you locate you locate the experiences of the members in the context where they emerge. So uh, you can simply just ask them, right? So what, what do you see have changed? What had happened in this era? Okay, and what what it sort of did something like that. But I know that you have them. It's yes. probably just putting it together and then uh, trying to abstract what are the highlights of those because I can see that in your paper. Some of your conclusions also point to that. So maybe you can pursue that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yu, and thank you as well to our presenters. Let's now welcome the fifth group under the same um, cluster. So the Research is entitled Respect My Opinion, Positioning and Myth Making Among Marcos Voters After 2022 Elections. Our presenters for Group 5 are Praise Madison, Daniela M. Del Rosario, Denise Logina Bilao, and Maria Fea S. Mandap. Their supervisor is are Mr. John Abletis and Mr. Carl Russell Reyes. Examiners are Mr. Samuel Cabuag and Dr. Enrique Nino P. Leviste. So a pleasant morning to everyone. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge the presence of our thesis advisors, Mr. John Abletis and Mr. Carl Reyes, and our panelists, Dr. Enrique Nino Leviste and Mr. Samuel Cabuag, the people to whom we owe a great debt of gratitude for their assistance and contribution to our study. We are Praise Del Rosario, Denise Lau, and Thea Mandap, here to present our study entitled, Respect My Opinion, Positioning and Making Among the Marcus Voters After the 2022 Presidential Election. May 9, 2022, the day of Bongbo Marcos Jr.'s presidential victory in the national elections, where a series of scrutiny followed suit from rival political camps, camps citing his familial ties and the legacy left by his father, Ferdinand Marcos Sr. Contentions were then raised concerning the recalculated procedures of aggressive disinformation that ignited years before the country's electoral campaign. campaign, campaign. This prompted the to examine how his political support is generated and maintained, especially through the views and experiences of his supporters. And as such, the prominence of BBM support groups online warranted the emergence of social movement online communities, or SMOCs. A more detailed approach entails the interpretation of their online engagement and interaction in social media, which validates the assertion that its function was an integral tool to his presidential campaign. 
Furthermore, guided by government's framing analysis and SNOW's collective action frames, this paper seeks to understand the perspectives of Bongo Marcos supporters by examining their interpretation of Marcos narratives. And in the culmination of our data gathering and analysis, positionality and myth-making emerged as key concepts to describe the persistence of Marcos fabricated narratives and application of his support. In creating the myth, first we define what SMOCs are. SMOC stands for Social Movement Online Communities. And as defined by Karen Jowers and Gabby, it is a sustained network of individuals working individuals working to maintain an overlapping set of goals and identities tied to, tied to a social movement linked through quasi-public online discussions. So uh, to further understand SMOCs, we use David Snow's um, collective action frames and Irving Goffman's frame analysis to provide a reason in sustaining and generating the support uh, of, in SMOCs. And so, uh, in, when we talk about SMOCs, the, the most dominant narrative when it comes to bystanders is that these bystanders are not currently engaging in the movement, but, are, but they only have the potential but they only have the potential to be allies once the movement frames are adopted. And it is through uh, political myth-making that uh, the dominant narrative is framed. On the account of political myth-making, so political myth-making is a generally accepted and uncontested political theory that assigns a particular significance to certain historical events, using the romanticization of the past as a means of appealing to public feelings of lost and disillusionment. It is founded in a social perception of lost coherence, as Vladimir Tismini puts it. Myths not only try to explain reality, but also act upon it, if not even supplant it. When societies tend to lose their center and polarize along belligerent lines, a sustained collective consciousness it becomes impossible without this nucleus of communality. As a result, the political myth is intended to substitute the void left by a lost past or center. So as such, we see myth-making entails the creation of stories, symbols that draw on deeply held cultural traditions and historical beliefs in order to legitimate and solidify authority. In achieving this, efforts have been directed to saturate the audience with all sorts of information up to a point that the propagation efforts appears to be without an author. Next would be the Golden Age. So Ariatin Jr. and Reyes highlights that the Marcus truth was able to survive because of its tangible reproduction of knowledge, which includes mostly printed materials from publishers and connected to the Imelda or Ferdinand Marcos. They have further discovered that these published sources were used as a basis for the creation of Marcus heritage sites in Ilocos. These narratives contained established facts which were weaved and embellished with myths, which make it hard to be as distinguished as a lie. As such, Golden Age scholars strive to effectively idealize the portrayal of society's foundational moments by both asserting the basic characteristics of the community and eliminating political fault lines in the present. And as an example, the Philippines is also no stranger to the politics and mythology of the Golden Age, especially in 1978, the Kilusang Bagong Lipunan, or the New Society Movement, as founded by Ferdinand Marcos Sr. This ideology's foundation may be found in defense of the imposition of martial law as a constitutional form of government with social improvement as the primary goal. Positioning refers to the relations of social representations and social identities by exploring the self through the others. It explores how, pow how, how power dynamics play a role in the formation of one's identity and delves into the different positions that come with their respective rights and responsibilities. Markova suggests that discussing identity involves considering both oneself and the others, and that understanding social representations require examining public conversations where individuals interact and generate these representations. Positioning is employed in the study by how individuals and bystanders within the SMOCs position themselves within different social contexts. Next slide. We collected data by selecting participants through snowball and criteria. So um, for a research question, how do self-identified BBM supporters interpret, understand, and recreate provided information? 
First, understanding the dynamics of political participation in the digital age is crucial in assessing the effectiveness of political campaigns and their impact on public opinion. The study of the Marcus campaign and the digital support can provide insights into the strate strategies and tactics used by political actors to influence the public discourse and mobilize support. Second, analyzing the narratives of Marcus supporters can provide valuable insights into the ideological underpinnings of their support and the shed light on factors that motivate their pol political participation. Third, highlighting the functional agency of Marcus supporters in political participation can help to challenge the notion that their support is merely a product of ignorance or mere blind loyalty. Next would be the scope and limitation. So the study primarily aims to identify and address the gaps in understanding the on the ground level actions and behavior of a collective group of Bongbong Marco supporters. The study will focus on the views and perspectives of select group of participants who self identify as BBM supporters. The findings of the study should not be generalized to all BBM supporters as the perspectives and experiences of the selected participants may, be, may not be representative of all BBM supporters. As such, the study will also not cover the perspectives and experiences of non-supporters of BBM or other political candidates, which may limit the generalizability of the findings to the broader population. So, so for the methodology, we collected data by selecting participants through snowballing criterion sampling approach with the following qualifications, a self-identified self -identified pro Marcos may or may not be a member of an online political group and voted for Marcos Jr. in the May 2022 elections. A series of interviews were conducted online with a total of eight participants and open-ended questions regarding the participants' support for BBM and their engagement online. Additionally, collection of data occurred through participant observation by voluntary admission inside online political support groups in Facebook, and thematic analysis was the data technique used as it is equipped to expand on the data of the study, namely generation of patterns, identification of themes, among others. So because of this uh, study's political nature, this urged us to broach the topic sensitively by first identifying our biases as researchers. So first, um, there is an assumption that as students of Ateneo de Manila, we are anti-Marcos and anti-Duterte because of the um, f critiques that we have done before the previous administration. And aside from that, uh, in the previous election, uh, Ateneo has also been uh, known for expressing their support towards the opposition, specifically Sileni Robredo. And aside from that, uh, our personal political alignment also posed uh, some risks in biased representation towards uh, writing the paper. And um, it also proved to be a difficulty in finding uh, willing participants for our study. And so to address these biases, we made sure to uh, maintain transparency and trust with our participants by uh, ensuring that the phrasing of our questions are neutral. And we also uh, ensured their confidentiality uh, in, especially in writing the paper, uh, by using pseudonyms to, 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 to provide uh, anonymity for our participants. Um, this portion. This portion argues that bystanders are not merely passive recipients of information, but are active agents of the narrative formation as well. Filling the gap on Ong and Kambanya's disinformation networks, as well as the degree of emphasis given to moment propagandists in understanding the emergence and success of collective action frames. This highlights the agency of individuals at the lowest tiers of the hierarchy. As the data suggests, it is through this positioning and the dominant narrative frames that further strengthens their beliefs, and not only because of the information disseminated through mainstream channels. Next slide, please. The dominant myth narrative surrounding the Marcuses portray him as a heroic soldier with superhuman capabilities to embody ideological continuity. Through sentimental longing, this perception of the golden age now becomes the blueprint of what an ideal Philippine society should be. By presenting Marcos as a heroic soldier and superhuman through tangible structures, 
The myth seeks to evoke a sense of nationalism among Filipinos, portraying him as a decisive leader, protecting the country from external threats. BBM has utilized the concept of ideological continuity, attempting to portray himself as someone who shares his father's vision for the country. As a matter of illustration, this idea had been propagated through respondents' thoughts on the matter. For instance, Jose situates that yung mga Marcos na sa Google lang yun eh. Sample sa mga Marcos Gold makikita mo kaysa daw nakikita sa YouTube. Miguel, on the other hand, is fascinated by Marcos' superhuman capabilities as he states. Nakita naman namin ang projects ni Marcos kasi mismo friend ko nakatira sa Batak, Malacanang of the North. So, nakita ko talaga projects na sa Locos, yung mga windmill, mga makikita mo maunlad ang bayan nila. On the account of ideological incontinuity, we see that Jose again believes that, well, number one is magandang naiwan ng tatay niya eh. What if yung mga di natuloy o meron siyang naiwan ng tatay niya na gusto ipagpatuloy, baka maramdaman natin. So why not? The first and foremost integral concept would be that of elder revelance. Older generations are, view, are revered in Philippine society as significant persons who may impart wisdom, experience, and information to younger generations via obedience. The psychological theory of carrying on the repeating of these tales and utilize them as one of, if not the entire, only foundation for the validity and the veracity of these tales. As shared by Miguel, the driving force for his decision to vote for Marcos was based entirely on the stories of his grandmother. So, kwento ng mga lolo ko, time ni Marcos, sobrang maayos pamumuhay. Nagkaroon madaming project, ganun, na hanggang ngayon ginagamit po natin. As such, the level of respect according to seniors in a community to which a person belongs to is positively correlated with how much younger generations trust in the wisdom and experience of their elders. In other words, younger individuals are more likely to seek out the advice and aid of older people and look to them as sources of knowledge, experience, and insights. Because it encourages intergeneral relationships, acknowledges knowledge and experience of their elders, and as well as upholding the ties to family and community that are so important to Filipino identity. Filipino moral of Gutang na Loob is strongly connected to patron-client frameworks, which are social systems in which a powerful individual, the patron, offers assets or other advantages to a weaker individual. Through pakikisama, the concept of utang na loob plays a critical role in this relationship as it creates a sense of obligation on the past to a client to repay the patron for assistance or favors that were given. Next slide, please. Political figures' communication of an underdog narrative may instill confidence in members of the organization as they overcome their shared disadvantage. The underdog framing strategy is widely used by charismatic politicians to create an emotional connection and a sense of belonging among their supporters. Next slide, please. Finally, we have political nostalgia. So tying all the complexities of these concepts together would be that of political nostalgia, which is separated in three parts. First, a sense of collective identity and national pride, wherein Marcos supporters connect themselves with the manufactured myths. Second, the portrayal of president as of the people, where president's resilience and determination overcome adversity. And last, the building of trust and credibility as founded by political dissent towards the liberal party. Through the faming of the oppositional party or the elite, Sense of dissolution of the othering and political nostalgia through new society movements help mobilize the group of people to their shared identity or goal. Next slide, please. Positioning in interpersonal relations. So we identify the key themes from our data that are classified under this category. Firstly, the transience of politics. Next slide, please which refers to the participants' common belief that politics is an entity divorced from their personal lives and are mere discourses discussed trivially. Secondly, fear of family divisions, which is reflective of Filipino values that interpret politics as a divisive matter and an instigator to family quarrels. Thirdly, kin involvement in narrative creation, where narratives are grown from familial context and yields collective decision-making. And lastly, intimate relations that affect political choices, where involvement and efforts of their direct kin are, are influential to political choices, and stated here are corresponding accounts gathered from our participants. So the second type of positioning that we have identified is through their, is is their positioning relative to the adversary and the political campaign. So... So this type of positioning reflects the self according to how they see the adversary in the political campaign. And it is also in this in this pattern is reflected in the attitudes of our participants toward the toward uh, the opposition by locating themselves in the moral order. 
So earlier we mentioned that position that uh, the positioning theory and how the self is identified through, through the other. And in this type of positioning, these individuals locate themselves through the moral order. So despite us not being mentioned, despite us not mentioning uh, the, the opposing camp, they still find ways to bring up uh, the, the strategies of the opposing camp. So there's still an element of the us versus them, wherein they are actually placing boundaries through the moral orders. So by labeling, by identifying uh, characteristics of the, of the um, opposition supporters, such as being aggressive, uh, the youth now are being aggressive and they're not being respectful to their, to their uh, elders. So uh, by identifying these characters, it already places a boundary between us and them. So we're not like them. We're not aggressive like them. And these, char this, these characteristics are related to their encounters with the, op with, uh, the supporters of the opposition. And um, another statement was... They were some of the respondents were actually enticed to vote for Lenny Robredo, if not for the continuous uh, criticism towards Marcos. Next slide, please. The, the third uh, type of positioning that we have identified is within the support networks. And this type of positioning uh, locates the self within the collective of Marcos supporters. So uh, we have identified uh, two types of pro Marcos. One is one are the bystanders, which also branches out to uh, several types of graduation. And the second one are the diehards or the loyalists. So bystanders, according to them, are those who voted and actively sought content, but do not actively participate in the collective group activities to show support. So uh, these bystanders, they're still, they're not just one collective. There's still um, a gradation of bystanders wherein one, they're either a voter uh, who actually believes in the platforms presented by, Mark, by BBM, or they are ones who, or they are the ones who are related to uh, people who have experienced the who have experienced the the uh, actions of Marcos Senior back in the golden age. And next is the die diehard loyalists are those who, whose support has stayed and has spanned over the years and who have uh, unwavering support. So whether the, the dominant frame changes or not, these uh, diehard loyalists, uh, Marcos supporters, will still have their support for, for him. So for the positioning in social media, the common themes under positioning in social media are the following, reflections of anti-intellectualism, which is the existence of elitism ingrained in the behavior of the opposition's supporters in terms of intellectualization, which potentially lead to stigmatization and othering. This uh, doubts on the credibility of the media news, where rampant disinformation have lost the general public's faith in reliance in credible media institutions. Na nation's rep representation, which is the collective desire to seek approval and validation from a foreign outlook through comparison, and lastly, the solidified usage of social media, where the evolution of social media earned its position as, as a primary modality of information and communication, which made the majority of Filipinos resorting to social media during the 2022 elections commonplace. Stated here are corresponding accounts gathered from our participants. Um, excuse me, I'm sorry for butting in, but since we're pressed for time, would you like to go to the conclusion part? Okay. Thank you. While the strength of the hierarchical network cannot be ignored with the framework of the study, including bystanders or supporters being crucial, this article presents an alternate perspective to concentrate on the lowest levels of the hierarchy who are classified as just receivers of information. Thus, the emergence of social movement online communities, or SMOCs, has profoundly changed how social movements are structured and function online. The anthropological positionality of Marcos supporters and their relationship to manufactured myths are investigated and analyzed in the study by elucidating the complex relationships between political posture, cultural identity, and narrative construction. 
As such, it gives insight on how myth-making and storytelling may be used to impact social and political dynamics and positionality. This recognition is particularly essential in the context of cultural values in Philippine society, such as depth of gratitude, elder reverence, dominance of patriarchal systems, and underdog framing. Individuals strengthen their support by sharing their personal political experiences and adding to the story, which leads to the construction of an organic myth. Therefore, it is crucial to understand how moral principles and cultural values influence political attitudes and conduct in order to promote understanding and dialogue amongst people who hold different viewpoints. Thank you. Thank you, Group 5. Now I'm calling on Mr. Samuel Kabuag for his comments. Okay po, maraming salamat po for inviting me and congratulations to the presenters. Um, yung unang ko po ay isang comment at isa po ay com uh, questions. So yung iba pong comments ko ay uh, nasa manuscript na lang kasi me medyo ano lang, may iba ng mga minor lang naman. So yung una po ay you mentioned, you premise naman in your paper yung, position, yung positionality ninyo and your um, political biases, if if I may, uh, and you are cave careful in, in a sense, naman in your interview, as you mentioned in your methodology. Um, however, um, upon reading your manuscript, some of the statements I measure sharply toned, paren, and meron paring judgment towards the interlocutors and the uh, the overall um, population or yung target. Um, 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 target niyo as your um, object of inquiry. So, in lang, siguro, um, tay, uh, ano lang, I would just like to encourage you to kindly rephrase lang yung some of the terms that you're using because medyo offensive pa rin siya in some way. Um, yun, yun po yung una kung comment. Pangalawa, um, well, you mentioned yung, um, uh, yung frames na ginamit nyo, no? yung theoretical um, frames na um, you use in your um, research. Uh, however, the process of the whole like framework is not really explicitly discussed because um, in the um, in the proposal, not very clear. Siya. However, in the final output, it parang it got lost. No, so I don't know if it is like a, a decision with by you and your advisors, but uh, feel free to comment along the on. And lastly, ang pinaka question ko dito is, um, while your interviews are like in, um, on specific um, pro Marcos supporters, no, how would you uh, make sense, siguro, of this pro Marcos group as a social movement? Because it's not really that clear or explicitly stated in the thesis. Thank you so much. Anyone from the group? Okay, so uh, thank you, Sir Sam. Uh, okay, so we had quite some difficulty in uh, in dealing with the framework and the theoretical framework because uh, initially in the proposal we wanted to uh, we wanted to look at two different online groups, but since we weren't able to find people who are actually uh, who are actually members of the online of the online groups? Uh, we shifted to uh, we shifted more towards the bystanders because these are the people that we actually encountered more. Tapos, uh, and since it's not uh, and since we we actually shifted a lot on the theories that we used, so uh, the ones that stayed were the collective action frame by. David Snow and the frame analysis by Irving Goffman. And uh, so basically we used those two uh, frameworks to, to uh, identify how the political myths, how the existing political myths have been, uh, have been dominating the perception towards the Marcoses. And, we don't. We didn't really. We just applied the theories by Goffman and Snow uh, in the concept of myth. In the concept of political myth making. Uh, 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kabuag. And now for um, Dr. Nino's comments. Thank you, Art. Uh, first of all, congratulations to Den, Praise, and Thea. You know, uh, I had um, immense fun reading the paper, but I do have comments and questions as well. You know. uh, first of all, um, the idea of myth making, and this certainly relates to one of the revelations you shared, you know, that uh, coming from a particular political slant, you know, uh, the use of the term myth making could already be construed, you no? Know? And I do, I do understand where you are coming from and where the literature on myth making is, you know, and what it's all about. But it might be uh, construed, you know, based on your own political leanings as a judgment in itself, you no? Know? Is there a possibility of using stories or storytelling, you no? Know? After all, you mentioned that as your conceptual anchor in a way rather than using myth making no certainly prudential judgment is yours and your advisors but probably something to think about and explore further would be to use stories and experiences of marcos supporters rather than automatically labeling these experiences as myths which is i think what the problem is all about to begin with no um, secondly, I, I wish to commend the group for a rather comprehensive presentation of evidences no, as to how individual agency or individual subjectivities position themselves. And I would like to get a sense, and this relates to my first question, whether in the context of uh, your engagement with Marcos loyalists, no, whether there were uh, points of divergence or whether within a particular Marco support block, did you get a sense of contestations within as well? Thank you, Doc, Doc Levista. Uh, for your first question, uh, we actually considered delving into the background of each participant in order to be familiarized with their stories. So, uh, of course, the our primary approach in uh, discussing uh, sensitive sensitive topics like the, these is to actually avoid uh, sounding judgmental and also to sound very, avoid sounding dismissive because uh, we have already heard testaments from our participants that uh, oppo uh, supporters from opposing candidates have already been have already stigmatized them and labeled them as. Bobo, which also gave gave them uh, this, which also led to othering, and as such, it also gave way to hostility and vitriol in terms of identifying as BBM supporters. And well, and 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 then as much as we wanted to actually d delve into their personal stories, uh, as since we are bounded by time, we were only given, uh, we were only, we only, we we had to eliminate different factors in actually uh, addressing our research research problem uh, should we be, should we have been given enough time uh, we would have uh, we would have uh, employed this suggestion but uh, in another sense uh, we would also we would also consider using storytelling uh, as well in uh, uh, familiarizing ourselves with their backgrounds because um, our main literature uh, by Ong and Cabanes, which is the network of uh, architecture of network disinformation, uh, didn't necessarily tackle uh, stories about those on the ground. So our our uh, one of our main focuses in accomplishing this study is to actually uh, be more uh, in, be more close or apart from familiar as ourselves. We actually uh, we a approach our study on the grassroots level, and that allowed us to give us a glimpse or a, a glimpse or a partial discernment on what on their views and how they uh, how their support is generated and how it is evolved. And as for your second question, um, what I'm sorry, but what kind of contentions were you uh, referring to? Well, I was wondering if there were. Uh points where Marcos loyalists themselves would have disagreements about how 
um, their ideas of uh, prowess, for instance. Diba? Um, I think one of you guys mentioned yung, uh, the portrayal of the first Marcos as superhuman, no? capable of anything, no? charismatic even. And whether there are actually um, moments where even within that block, even within that group, may pagkakaiba, may, pagdi, may disagreement in, in, how, in how these things are portrayed. Kasi the tendency, and not only for Marcos loyalists, but even for opposition, is to think of these groups as monoliths, right? To think of these groups as coherent entities. So I would just like to get a sense of tensions within a particular group, which is, I think, also important to, to highlight. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, as we already, as we mentioned before, the fact that they already veer away from the self-identification of being a BBM supporter is already self-explanatory on how hostile and how there is a stigma uh, is existing within their blocks already. So one of the so one of the most uh, interesting, intriguing uh, interviews we had was one of our participants actually acknowledged how BBM is how BBM is actually uh, is actually lacks in terms of administering people in positions. However, what however what we what we got at the end is how instead of actually putting uh, putting accountability on BBM himself, they were actually blaming the people surrounding BBM. Another point is we saw how uh, his, we saw how rampant the. Uh, we saw how rampant the comparisons in terms of international uh, uh, outlook. So, as much as there were a lot of foreign, as, as much as there they were, they had all the, they all had these deep, deep desire to uh, seek seek approval from foreign uh, from foreigners and from foreign countries. They also had this sentiment of uh, the uh, the Marcus regime. Uh, Plant, uh, sorry, they also had the sense of uh, clarity with the Marcos regime and on how they actually had the participation in uh, the the dwindling of our, the dwindling of the state of our country. So, per, particularly in terms of martial law, a lot of them also expressed uh, uh, resentment and grief in how martial law was also uh, implemented here. And among other contentions as well, they also, uh, among other contentions as well, I don't, I'm not sure if this is a contention, but most of them were also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, politics is a divorced uh, entity from their lives. So, in as much as they, in as much as they acknowledge the mistakes and the wrongdoings in the uh, Marcos family and the Marcos regime, they also become dismissive and actually, in a sense, indifferent in terms of actually handling uh, in terms of actually acknowledging the their uh, shortcomings their defects and whatnot okay thank you i think you know i'm just a final point and you don't have to react anymore to this thank you then no, for answering that i think there was a rather notable quote you no know, in one of uh, uh the discussions in your manuscript where a uh, participant you know, a research participant said i'm not a supporter but I believe, no? So I think uh, that could be an entry point to further articulate, no? Nandun naman yung datos, eh, to further articulate, well, uh, divergences from within. Not necessarily contestations, but divergences from within, which I think uh, contributes immensely to your discussion on how we can better understand uh, how Marcos loyalists think what they see, what they view, what they don't believe in, what they believe in. So the, those nuancing, you know, those, those um, opportunities to nuance further would be very important. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Nina and to Sir Kabuag. And thank you also to our presenters. Bear with us as we are down to the final group. So the sixth group. The research is entitled The Schuber Explosion, The Social Appeal and Sudden Popularity of Virtual YouTubers 
and streamers among both viewers and content creators in the Philippines and their experiences and their experiences. Let's now welcome the presenters, Ray Ryan Zamora, Juan Carlos Miguel, David Palanca, and Zaria Erin Almosera. Their supervisor is Mr. John Martin Bernard Gappi, and the examiner is Dr. Enrique Nino P. Leviste. Um, uh, hello, uh, good afternoon everybody. Um, before we begin, we would like to acknowledge and thank our supervisor, Sir Gapi, whose guidance throughout the thesis has helped us immensely. And of course, our panelist, uh, Dr. Nino, whose critiques and comments has helped further uh, develop our thesis. Thank you. There we go. So, <clears throat> next slide. Oh, just need to go to the technical issues. <laughs> Half dead. So, to introduce, to introduce our topic, next slide. Two slides, yeah. Uh, first, uh, no, I'm talking about, oh, I'm introducing what VTubers are. V they're basically they're basically they're basically animated models that are operated by humans that that in, that are serve to entertain you either through clips like the first slide with Kizuna Ai that led to the popularity and rise in December 2019, and then the subsequent breakthrough in the West uh, this pandem this pandemic uh, during the start of the pandemic of March 2020, and this is actually one of the first papers on this topic uh, within this locality because so far all of the papers in of the papers on this topic are mostly either by uh, by our other Southeast Asian neighbors uh, Indonesia or Malaysia or mainly technical papers based uh, from companies based of Japan or uh, Western more Western studies or more Western studies such as those from uh, Malmo University by Anna Bernard Turner next slide please so so our study is uh, uh, aiming to find out why these VTubers have become such a super big phenomenon within the last three years or so, within the last three years or so. And we also aim to examine how the parasocial, the parasocial uh, theory has evolved as with our research questions, by, uh, which could be explained by Zarya better. So throughout, we focus on three research questions. So the first research question we ask, uh, is the virtual content creator of our VTuber participants uh, motivated by personal pursuits or uh, through existing parasocial relationships with other VTubers? Um, do these parasocial relationships make a big impact in how they create their own VTuber personas and the direction of their own content? Uh, second question, through the process of being a VTuber, has there been any changes with the operator or the human behind the VTuber persona? And particularly, how they perceive their own uh, parasocial relationships with their viewers and with others? And three, um, what, uh, what has there been reflections? What are the reflections uh, of, about their activity as VTubers? So, so we basically in the in our research objectives we, we restated some uh, most of our research question, but one of the more important things is that we aim to also address a literature gap, both in both as an both as a qualitative study within this field focused towards more more of the content creators rather than viewers themselves, as well as a local gap since there it's the first in the locality. Second, we are aiming to see how parasociality has evolved over the, evolved over the years since it was first introduced. And then while also in, in the third point revisiting Irving Goffman's, uh, Irving Goffman's uh, theory of dramaturgy and uh, Judith, Judith Butler's idea of gender as a performance as well. And also to find out how these VTubers started their careers uh, and how different their work is with each other and how differently they define it. 
So with that, I give the majority of the floor to. Sorry. Okay, so one of uh, the core theories in which our research is grounded upon is the parasocial interaction theory. So parasocial interaction theory was first conceptualized as a social psychological theory by Horton and Wall, specifically in relation to traditional mass media. There are two key actors in this theory. First, we have the viewer and we have the persona. So the viewer is the audience, while the persona holds a more complicated role. The persona is a construct, a role, created by the performer, or in the case of the VTuber, the operator, for the purposes of media communication. Parasocial interaction begins at the moment of the viewer's exposure to the persona, where the viewer feels a type of attraction to the persona. So there are three types of attraction. There is social, physical, and task attraction. So social attraction concerns itself with the personality of the persona. Physical attraction is, of course, regarding physical features. And task, task attraction is regards to the perceived credibility of the persona, which usually uh, regards to the newscasters, radio show hosts, etc. Et so um, when parasocial interactions become parasocial relationships, um, they are characterized as one-sided relationships that become long-term, enduring, and may bring about positive or negative consequences to the viewer's well-being. When social media sites like Twitter and Facebook grew popular, uh, a new form of media communication introduced a new aspect to the parasocial interaction theory. So this media communication is called mass personal communication, which is defined as one, when traditional mass media is used to convey interpersonal communication or vice versa, and two, when both mass and interpersonal communication are simultaneously done. An example of mass personal communication that appears in our research is live streaming and the accompanying chat feature. Okay, um, so as mentioned, um, virtual influencers are pretty much computer generated characters or models that take the place of human influencers. So what are the different types? So there, uh, the study we use for this explored three different types of influencers based on appearance and behavior, which are the anime-like virtual influencer, the human-like virtual influencer, and the human virtual influencer. So these virtual influencers in the study did not speak or do any human verbal language because their brand really wasn't uh, entirely centered on their digitally created looks. So between the anime-like uh, virtual influencer and the human virtual influencer, there wasn't much of a difference when it came to uh, the uh, reactions of the respondents. And the uh, least like type of virtual influencer was the human-like one due to how off-putting its human likeness is. Uh, this can actually be possibly explained by the uncanny valley effect, uh, where people usually feel a sense of unease when seeing highly realistic robots or digitally generated humanoids. Um, the Kang's study also establishes that other factors besides the social factors of forming parasocial relationships add to the appeal. And additionally, it asks if these factors actually enhance the formation of parasocial relationships. So these factors are uh, their, their uh, personality, uh, personality, interactivity, and creativity of the virtual influencer. Um, and so the social act, uh, attraction, so this study by uh, Stein, Reeves, and Anders, uh, con concluded that mental human likeness and perceived similarity are strong variables that present a parasocial response from the viewer. Um, they're actually much more significant instead of the visual human likeness and the wishful identification, which are pretty much almost uh, negligible factors. So um, a recent study by Anna Turner actually argues that VTubing is a platform for VTubers to help them overcome personal insecurities and explore different um, methods to pre present themselves and express their identities. Uh, so Goffman's theory of self-presentation, which asserts that there is a cutoff between the publicly and socially seen front stage and backstage, is used as a framework to analyze the response from the respondents. Uh, 
So next slide, please. So the conceptual framework in which our research operates in works in two directions. So the first direction we have, uh, we examine the parasocial relationship the viewer has with our own VTuber participants. So this is how we see how the parasocial re relationship of the viewers impact the direction of their content and how the, uh, the VTuber participants create their own persona. The second uh, direction is we also examine the uh, VTuber participants' own parasocial relationships with other VTubers, in which we examine how these parasocial relationships can inspire and motivate these actors. So the parameters in which we define what a relationship is parasocial is uh, the presence of any of the three types of attraction, uh, feelings of enjoyment and gratification, and the regular viewership of these personas. Uh, okay, so for the research methodology, so we use a phenomenological study, a type of qualitative study that covers a social phenomenon's essence by exploring the meaning of uh, the experiences. So we felt that this was the most appropriate given the social phenomenon of VTubing. To answer why there was a surge in VTubing popularity, we also used the thematic analysis method and looked for patterns to identify themes in the data. The sense of flexibility was also advantageous because like, the qualitative method was helpful in accommodating new ideas and patterns while we were analyzing the data. Next slide, please. Okay, so we used the snowball sampling method, which generates a pool of respondents to referrals, and we only gathered information from participants who fit the criteria. Uh, the criteria being currently active VTubers who resemble humanoid uh, personas. Um, to contact the participants, we created and managed a Twitter account dedicated to messaging them through direct messages. So all of the interviewers, uh, interviews were conducted online, mainly through the video communications application called Zoom. As the spread of the participants' location made it around the Philippines made it very unfeasible to meet them physically and also to add an additional layer to protect their identities. Um, besides Zoom, we use Discord for one participant who preferred it over Zoom. Um, so Discord is another video communications um, platform, uh, an instant message messaging social platform. Um, so it was a very good alternative to Zoom. So, so um, to give, so uh, just to give an initial impact for our data analysis, we these are our findings. Uh, over sixty six percent use anime style models. Basically, they basically they just look like people from uh, from an, from Japanese animated uh, media. And over ninety one percent of them are in the, are are independent. VTube, are independent VTubers at the time of the interview. That means that they do not work for any sort, any form of corporation or company or are not contractually obligated. And next slide. And then for our themes, we basically just, we basically had these three findings for them that for them that we, they do, that they do have, um, uh, that they don't, many of them don't have surprisingly parasocial relationships with other content creators. Um, if and the second most common relationship that they have is mutual is mutual intimate relationships where it's more reciprocal and that they are indeed not engaging in any form of parasociality. Then a lot of them mentioned that their motivations to be a VTuber was, was a form of self-expression, but they also la love the idea of anonymity since it's not seeing their real face. And then finally that you know the presence of the uh, the presence of parasocial relationship in their content, which all of them said that exists. And for our data analysis, Zarya. All right, so as mentioned, our analysis is divided into three themes. So the first theme, we have parasocial relationships with other VTubers as a consumer. So the first type of relationship that we found is the entertainer audience relationships. So this kind of relationship is the most similar to how Hawthorne and Wall first conceptualized this theory. So participants commonly express that they found watching videos and clips on YouTube a much more enjoyable experience rather than watching VTubers live. Uh, because of this format preference, the opportunity to directly interact with the VTuber is limited. In fact, 
the participants note that they did not find value in attempting to chat or interact with the VTubers they watch on stream due to the overwhelming amount of chats that they see and other viewers that are attempting to interact with the VTuber. Um, other barriers that the participants have expressed in regards to interacting with uh, VTubers also include language barriers. Uh, the second, uh, uh, however, despite the lack of desire to interact on stream, the participants still enjoy watching these VTubers due to the VTubers' personalities. This is a manifestation of the social attraction element of parasocial interaction. Uh, one of the participants noted that while the design uh, of the VTuber model helps attract viewers, it is still the VTuber's personality that has a high impact effect on viewers. Uh, sorry, uh, just a moment. So the second uh, inter type of interaction that we found is also parasocial relationships that were formed. Uh, the common reason as to why uh, our participants donated money, bought merchandise, and regularly tried to interact with the VTuber was they found them funny, entertaining, and charismatic enough to do so. So uh, what separates those, uh, what separates them from uh, entertainer audience type of relationship is there is a strong sense of community brought about by these parasocial relationships. So the last type of um, uh, relationship we found is the mutual, inter in mutual intimate uh, relationship. So this kind of relationship is, um, wait, hold a second. Uh, this type of relationship is actually uh, starts as parasocial relationships that transition into reciprocal uh, relationships. This kind of transition only happens under very specific circumstances that mass personal communication enable. An example of this is when one of the participants started as a fan of a VTuber, and when the VTuber asked for volunteers to help in streams, they volunteered and this enabled them to see the quote backstage personality of the VTuber they watched. I'm moving on to the second theme is we have motivations to be a VTuber. So uh, the common trend of our participants is that uh, VTubing has a, is a way of self-expression, but this self-expression comes through an idealized form, which is their VTuber persona. So there is, uh, depending on how the VTuber persona is conceptualized, there may or may not be a clear delineation between the operator, which is the human behind the persona, and the VTuber persona itself. Uh, the second uh, motivation to be a VTuber is the anonymity, the masking that it provides that face cam VTubing, the regular streaming does not provide. So the last theme we have is the presence of parasocial relationships and participants' content. General trend of answers is that there is parasocial interactions and relationships present within uh, the content that our VTuber participants create. Um, community support is very integral in the VTuber industry and essentially uh, their interactions with their audience is actually packaged as a product they sell. So, because high amount of viewers in their stream is immediately equated to success and there is an emphasis on being appealing and enjoyable enough that the success is continued. Uh, however, uh, Participants express that there are negative experiences, negative side effects to parasocial relationships, wherein some experience stalking and breaches of privacy. But however, these are just seen as an unfortunate reality and is part of the parcel of being a VTuber. Thank you, Group 6. Uh, may I invite Dr. Nino for his comments? Thank you, guys. Interesting paper. Uh, I learned a lot from it. And I also accept the fact that this is a topic that I am operating from a position of intellectual impoverishment. No. So, so, uh, 
Um, um, my first question, because one of your objectives, correct me if I'm wrong, is that, well, as far as your manuscript is concerned, is that you also wanted to learn about and to examine how, in the context of the Philippines, detubing has been seen as important or has been seen as integral. No? And I would just like to get a sense from you guys, being the experts, I would just like to get a sense of how V-tubing is particularly seen in the context of the Philippines. Because admittedly, you had local and international respondents. Only, or Only local. Only local, okay. So is there a particular slant as far, or is there a particular temperament or flavor as far as V-tubing in the Philippines is concerned compared to other contexts? Uh, yes, actually. In terms of in terms of a lot of these of the Philippines, a lot more are very much independent VTubers, which means a lot of them exercise their own brand. None of them are under con are under contract. None of them work mm, well. Most of them do not work for a corporation. In fact, in our in our in our participants of the twelve, we had only one out of the twelve worked for a company at the time of the interview. Currently, now two of them do, but um, it's saying that. A lot of a lot of the times that Filipino, it's showing that there are a lot of creative ideas going around, especially when it comes to self-expression, with how they want to present themselves in this character that isn't like their face themselves as themselves as they are. And a lot of the times, a lot of them also exercise the very independent streak that, even though that they are under contract, they only follow the general guideline rules. They are. It's up to them to control their own branding, how they want to be perceived in the community itself. Is this level of independence something that is conspicuously Filipino? As you said, you're 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 emphasizing Ray that what what sets apart V tubing in the Philippines is that they operate on their own, right? They're not tied to a company or whatnot. Is that something that is strong? as far as the Philippine context is concerned, the Philippine V-tubing context or landscape is concerned? In terms of uh, a lot of the local bigger names in the V-tubing scene in the Philippines, a lot of them are in the, uh, it's very Filipino that a lot of them are independent. Um, especially since a lot of more bigger VTubers in the current, mar in the current uh, space right now, most of them are under very strict contracts and rules that they are not allowed to say they're not allowed to do they're not allowed to breach certain contracts not allowed to even say certain things or and even very limited in how to express themselves even in their character compared to compared to a lot of these a lot of the filipino vtubers thank you ray i think this is important to articulate more coherently and strongly in your manuscript going forward no because i think it also um addresses you know, one of your key objectives really which is to highlight how v-tubing looks like you know in the philippine context second question um is there a difference between v-tubing or the v-tuber as a content creator and the v-tuber as a performer because there seems to be um, a conflation of these two roles there might not be a significant difference after all. You're the experts anyway. I don't know. <laughs> no, no. But, but is there, no, and, and this is really well, a more personal question. Is, is there a difference really between uh, your role as a content creator and your role as a performer? Because that is probably something that will help further sharpen mm. the paper. Uh, to answer that question, uh, as said earlier, um, uh, from what I've seen, the VTuber persona is actually part of the product of what they sell. So um, it's been noted by one of the participants that, uh, as I said earlier, entertainer audience uh, interactions, these kinds of oh, sorry. these kinds of interactions with the viewers is uh, the product that they, that they sell. And part of this product is the perceived genuineness of these interactions. And so this genuineness of interactions stem from um, the persona itself and how legitimate the persona uh, is perceived to be. OK. 
Okay. Thank you, sorry. My final point is a comment, really, not a question. Uh, moving forward, no, uh, I think uh, because the conclusion part needs to be further developed, no, I think it would be immensely helpful if the team will go back to the Goffmanian uh, framing and basically share uh, your insights about how VTubing contributes in expanding you know, Goffmanian analysis, perhaps, you know, or how certain aspects or features of Goffmanian analysis or of Irving Goffman's theory is demonstrated and further highlighted. And what can we learn you know, from the Philippine experience of VTubing, you know, theoretically speaking? So something that can probably tighten you know, your, your argument moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you to our presenters. So we're now officially closing uh, the morning session. We thank our presenters, supervisors, examiners, faculty, guests, and attendees. We hope to see you at 1.30 p.m. for a parallel session. We're also inviting our examiners and guests to a lunch at the DSA office right now. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, back to me. Uh, we'll, we'll head back around 1 1.30. We'll try to make it 1.30. Okay. Uh, okay. So we'll be on time 1.30. I want, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ito. Okay. Thanks, Bye, sir. Have a good lunch. Have okay. a good the live. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.